we are live. So, welcome to Review and Thoughts, Zack Snyder's Justice League, a.k.a. Justice League Snyder Cut. I want to start by offering my condolences for Autumn Snyder, for Zack Snyder's family, Zack Snyder and his family, for Autumn Snyder's suicide. Grieving someone close to us dying is one of the hardest things to do in life, and it's something all of us have to go through, and my heart really does go out to him and and his family, and I understand that Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah was apparently her favorite song, so, you know, him putting that in the trailer and dedicating the movie to her is really sweet. And I realize some people are going to be cynical and think that I just said that so you'll feel bad about arguing with what I say in this video. Not at all. I'm going to criticize this movie in this video, so it would be ridiculously hypocritical of me to ask you, to ask that you do not criticize this video. Now, I realize this video is long. Honestly, it's probably going to end up really, really long because I have a lot to say. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. Also, if you're only interested in the review, that part of the video is not the whole length of the video to see its length. Check the time codes in the description box. I'm currently dealing with some back pain, but I still have a lot to say about the movies that I watch. So I'm going to speak faster until my back feels better. I start this video with a review, most likely with zero spoilers. If I spoil anything, I will warn before I do so. And hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers. You can, so you can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. As soon as I end the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers for the movie. And let's see. And almost definitely also the theatrical cut of this film. I haven't, I'm not sure if I'm going to spoil other Zack Snyder. I, th I think I'm going to, before I, yeah, I'll, I'll verbally warn and hold up an index finger if I spoil other Zack Snyder films. And let's see. And, and actually, yeah, in, in this review, I will also spoil the, the yeah, the, the, the DCU leading up to this, but I'm not going to be spoiling you know, I, I got to this, to the Snyder Cut a little late, so, you know, let's see, what has come out? I get, maybe, maybe the, the Suicide Squad is the only thing that's come out since, but yeah, I will not be spoiling that in this video. Now... I don't have any personal issues with most filmmakers. I wish Whedon wasn't abusive to those he works with. And, you know, not a fan of Snyder's politics. I mean beyond that. And I almost never let any issues I might have interfere with my review and analysis. I admire some of the work of both Joss Whedon and Zack Snyder. Now, I've heard some... I've heard various reports about, you know, I've, I've heard some people say that Whedon did his best to fix the, the, you know, yeah, when, when he made the theatrical cut of Justice League as much, you know, he, he didn't get everything. There, there were stipulations that he wasn't exactly happy with, but I've heard some people say that he t tried to just make the movie, you know, better than the, you know, he tried to fix the issues that were there with the material when he came in. And I've heard some say that he basically just, <clears throat> he basically just tried to, you know, make them make the movie bad so that, let's see. Um, 
yeah, because, like, you know, I'm not gonna, he seems to be a pretty terrible person, so I'm not, I'm, I have, I'm not gonna defend his character, but I do think that a lot of the theatrical cut, now that I've seen the Snyder cut, it's, like, there are, there are some of the writing here, it's just, it's baffling. And, and Joss Whedon tried to make, tried, tried to salvage what he could. Now, other than this movie and Dawn of the Dead, the Zack Snyder movies that I've seen, I've only seen the original theatrical cut. I have not watched, like, the Ultimate Edition and such. And let's see the and and the only Snyder movie that I have the, the only movie that Zack Snyder has directed that I haven't watched is the the uh, Legend of the Guardians: The Owls of Gafool, I think is what it's called. I'm I'm not familiar with that movie. I'm not familiar with those books. I have nothing against. I, I it's possible I'll watch it at some point. When it came to theaters, I wasn't interested, and since then, I just, I haven't found, like, a really good deal on a DVD of it. That's literally the only reason I haven't watched it. That's, you know, thinking about it, I guess almost all of Zack Snyder's movies I've watched in theaters. I've also watched, this is the only of his movies that I've only watched once. All of them I've watched again since as well. Now, so, the, the DCEU prior to the Snyder Cut. Man of Steel is fine, 7 out of 10. My issues with it are summed up very nicely by folding ideas. You know what? I'm going to go ahead and say something positive about it. I think the scenes of Child Clark struggling with sensory overload could be read as representing being on the spectrum, or other diagnoses of, of, you know, mental and emotional issues. And others say that you could read it into the movie as a whole as a coming out allegory. Representation, diversity, that's great. I, I really admire that. I wish that the movie surrounding those positives was better. But, yeah. Batman v Superman is a mess. For many reasons, explained well by folding ideas and renegade cut, I give it a 3 out of 10. The original Suicide Squad movie can be entertaining, but it's a complete mess due to the editing, also explained well by folding ideas and renegade cut. And now that he's done a video on it, I can add to the list that Cosmo Variety Hour does a great job as well. 5 out of 10. First Wonder Woman solo movie is excellent, 9 out of 10. The original Justice League is bad, 6 out of 10. And, yeah... That, let's see, right, yeah. Now we're back to the excellent ones. Aquaman, 8 out of 10. Jazam, 8 out of 10. Birds of Prey, 8 out of 10. Okay, so Wonder Woman 1984 is a complete and utter mess. I think the DCU is at its best when a director with a compelling vision is at the helm, especially when they're allowed an R rating, a lot of creative freedom. And once again, I think a lot of Wonder Woman 1984 is... Patty Jenkins' vision, so I'm not saying that it's a flawless... I still have hopes for... She's she's doing, like... What's the Star Wars movie called? Rogue Squadron, I want to say. I have high hopes for it. I think it was a fluke. I think she's still capable of delivering incredible movies, and, you know, I... Some of my favorite movies ever made are Monster and the first Wonder Woman solo movie. Anyway, yeah, so... The DCU is at its best when a director with a compelling vision is at the helm, especially when they're allowed an R rating and a lot of creative freedom. By far some of the best are Birds of Prey, Joker. Yes, I realize it's not technically DCU. It's not part of the over... The, it's not part of the main continuity, but... I mean... It's DC. It's being... It, it was made because these movies are doing well. And it is, you know, it's a director with a vision, R rating, a lot of creative freedom. And the, you know, I would say the Suicide Squad, not in all ways, but overall, in my opinion, the very best DCU film so far. And 
yes, let's see, that's, yeah, I've, I've, I've already mentioned I have issues with this, so I'm, yeah. I have a complicated relationship with Zack Snyder, and no, it's not that he's a DC director rather than an MCU director. On the one hand, he's definitely extremely talented. When it comes to the technical side of filmmaking, that was one sentence. Did not mean to make put an abrupt stop in between. Yeah. He has interesting ideas, and he's some sometimes able to execute them really well. 300 is one of the only movies, and not just by Zack Snyder, but any movie directed by anyone ever, where I would say that it does exactly what it means to. I disagree with the politics of it, but I can't really suggest any adjustments to it that wouldn't be based on trying to communicate other ideas and values than it does communicate. For what it wants to be, and, you know, sometimes when you say, oh, you know, it it got renamed for, some people say, oh, well, it didn't aim very high, did it? I would say 300 aimed very high. And for what, it, you know, it, it, hit the, it, it hit the bullseye. It is perfectly filmed, edited, cast, acted, written, and directed. It is exactly what, like, I read the, the comic. I actually, I, I think I only read it after, the, after watching the movie, and I was surprised by how much of the best stuff in the movie was added to the movie. It's not in the original comic. The, the original comic is, is quite good. I, it's Frank Miller, you know. He, when, when Frank Miller is good, he's incredible. Again, shame about how he's a complete lunatic. But the, the okay, to be fair, I don't think Zack Snyder is a complete lunatic. Anyway, and no, I would be saying that Frank Miller is a lunatic, even if he was like left wing. I'm he's he's legit. Like just read some of the ridiculous things he's. Anyway, the the I've I've gone back and forth on a couple of, you know, what, I'm I'm just gonna go ahead and and say the full thing that I. I, so I mentioned, yeah, this it's three hundred is one of the only movies where it really it's it's it does exactly what it means to it. it you know, I would say the first Die Hard is another case. And again, you know, I'm not conservative. That movie is fiercely conservative. But if you actually, I, th I think it was the it was the YouTuber Sean. If you watch his video about Die Hard, he points out things about it that like. I mean, hypothetically, technically, we should look at that and say, I mean, that's a that's kind of a mistake, isn't it? That, that kind of makes the movie worse. But when you really think about it, I, I, I forget exactly how he frames it. I, I think he also notes it is exactly what it means to be. It's, it, it, like, it, it perfectly, it is what conservatives, it's the way that conservatives think of these things. You know, and um, I'm, I'm not going to go into detail. You know what? I would just butcher it. Watch Sean's video with, you know, yeah, that's S-H-A-U-N, not W. And I, f I forget the exact title, but I'm almost certain that the t the title Die Hard is part of his video title. And just he, he nails it. I, I had not a lot of the things he points out. Like the last time I watched Die Hard, I wasn't really paying attention to things like that. So I didn't notice it, but when I heard him say it, I thought back and I was like, oh, that's so, that's so true. You know, uh, let's see, the first Conan movie, you know, there's, there's really not anything about that that is, you know, yeah. And, and I'm not saying all of these, not, not every single movie that I would place there is necessarily conservative, but these are some of the, the movies that especially come to mind like there are movies that I love I I think all three Lord of the Rings movies are masterpieces but like and I, I and I think that they are absolutely as good as like the 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 amount of skill on display is just through the roof you know I think hypothetically, like, I, I don't think they, they could have made it better then, but hypothetically, if 
if those movies were made today, you know, if, if someone just gave, like, if Peter Jackson had complete creative freedom, I, th I think he had, he, he had a tremendous amount, but I, I feel like I've read that there were a couple of things where they were like, no, that's, no, that's unacceptable, you know. And yes, I have watched the extended cuts, and I do think that largely they are better and much better. And part of it is also some of the effects, like the, the, there are just a couple of times where you can really tell, oh, you know, well, they have a really, one character that's really large and one character that's really small, so they use the forced perspective, and it really shows, because we've seen forced perspective before, you know, and just, yeah. But again, you know, tons of things amazing about those movies. Gollum, just perfectly, like, brought to life. The, the acting and the writing, so strong. But, yeah, I would not overall say, and I, I don't, I don't know that I would say that I think 300 is an overall better movie than a Lord of the Rings movie. Pick one, any of the three. But I do think that it completely hits the nail on that. I, th I think Zack Snyder is good at waiting until the effects can can handle his vision before he he tries. You know, I I I think on 300 he could have tried to go further, but the effects would not have held up. And, you know, so, because, like, when you look at some of the more recent movies Zack Snyder has directed, you know, he's clearly perfectly happy to go further than 300. I, I get the sense that he knew how far he could push the effects without them, you know, starting to look, but yeah, you know, the speed ramping, the immense amount of narration, the monologues. Like, I've heard some people say, ah, you know, the acting, ah, some of those performances, it's just ridiculous. They're way too, the, like, they're way too scenery-chewing. And I just, it's okay not to like it. It's perfectly okay. But I really don't think that they are even, even a fraction, even a percentage off from what they are, like, the, the, the things that Zack Snyder wanted to get through, he gets through perfectly. Like, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. Like, I've seen <sighs> Gerard Butler, I've seen him in other movies, and just, it's, like, he seems perfect for that kind of role. I wish he would take roles like that more. I, ultimately, I, I guess I haven't seen that many other movies by him, but it just doesn't, it seems like that was the exact right thing for him. And I just, I wish that people would keep making, not, not sequels, but spiritual successors to that and cast Gerard Butler. Anyway, I think Snyder, like when, when Zack Snyder works outside of ongoing canon, he can really deliver something incredible. Not that the, those always lead to incredible movies. Sucker Punch only works from a technical perspective, in my opinion. The ideas are in in it are quite ridiculous. If you're not sure why, watch Maggie Mae's Fish videos on the matter. In fact, watch all of her videos on Zack Snyder. They're excellent. But movies like Don't... Yeah, I'm really... I'm, I'm kind of showing my hand here. If, if you're, like, fiercely conservative, you're probably not going to agree with very much I say. And I don't want to, I don't want you to feel like I, you know, tricked you into thinking that this video was, I'm, I'm fiercely left-wing. So, anyway, movies like Dawn of the Dead, 300, Watchmen, there's a lot to love. He's significantly better when he does not try to tell an overall ongoing story and do franchise building. That I do not think he does well. And, and another thing is that he did not write those three movies. You know, other people had... You know, and, and Dawn of the Dead was written, you know, Zack Snyder didn't follow the script to the letter, but the script for that was written by uh, James Gunn, you know, and I mean, he's an incredible writer. So, yeah, you know, when when he has an incredible writer behind him, when he's div when he's adapting source material by brilliant minds like Frank Miller when he's not a lunatic and Alan Moore when he's not 
like I said, I'm uh, I'm I'm not saying like Alan Moore. He's definitely said some things that are quite out there, and he is very left wing. He's he's definitely not right wing. So anyway, I am not as far to the left. I'm I'm not an anarchist. I'm sure you know. There are some people who who make a case for anarchy. I don't completely agree with them. Anyway. Imagine if Man of Steel ended with no indication that there was going to be a franchise. Maybe one sequel or something, but definitely not certainty that this guy is a hero. End on him killing Zod, and then this ambiguity of, is that the last time he ever killed? Or does he get a taste for it? Infinitely more compelling, and no issue with us having to accept a hero when, as many people have pointed out, there were other ways to solve that problem like and and he's flying through these um what the, what's it called you know he's he's throwing zod through buildings yes some of the time it's zod throwing him through a building but other times it is definitely and and there's like there's one bit where it's like i want to say two skyscrapers and apparently like zack snyder has said in interview oh you know those were probably empty probably em probably empty it's during the day it's in metrop it's it's in a big city. No, they were most likely not empty. Like holy crap. Anyway, in Batman v Superman with Batman snapping and going completely evil, maybe he kills Diana after Superman kills Doomsday and sacrifices himself. You know, these are so much more like the moment that that movie says, you know, oh, it's okay now Batman's going to be a hero. Now he sees how good you know, Superman really was because of this one thing. Like, it's true that Superman was instrumental in stopping Doomsday, but that doesn't make up for... Like, I I saw one... Ah, what was the estimated number? I, I feel like I heard that most likely, yeah, we don't see it, because it's PG-13. Of course they're not going to show... Most likely, Superman in Man of Steel was responsible, partially at least, for hundreds of thousands, possibly a million or more, deaths of civilians. So, it's like, killing one really evil creature doesn't make up for all those human lives. I know not everybody agrees that Zack Snyder is emotionally mature, immature, and he just thinks that violence... You know, he... he is, is cool. He doesn't explore the ramifications like Christopher Nolan did. There are other YouTubers who do a better job uh, than I can explaining exactly why and how he's immature. And I realize not everybody agrees that it's a problem that he is immature. I don't think it has to be a problem for every movie. Like, I really hate that 300 is racist, but if you look away from that, which obviously we never should, then the immaturity of the violence doesn't have to be a problem, provided you do perceive it as just a celebration of fighting for freedom. I mean, if you change that movie so that it wasn't racist, like, I can't help but, like, if you flip the races so it's people of color fighting white conquerors to defend their home from colonizers, like, okay, the immaturity of the violence would still be a problem, but I do think that it would be a significantly less racist movie and actually you know, a lot more, like, I'm not saying that there were never, I'm, I'm not saying that all colonizers in, in history have been white, but that is a pretty significant chunk of it, you know, and, and one of the, one of the tools that racists use to make themselves seem less racist is claim, is, is you know, projection. They, they take the thing that they're doing, and then they claim that it's their, you know, the, the people they don't like who are doing it, which is, you know, it's, it's ridiculous that, that there's a stereotype that black people are, like, naturally more violent than white people, when it was white people keeping black people as slaves for hundreds of years, beating them, raping them, so... I'm going to move on. But I do think it is a problem for these movies if he wants to make a dark version of comic books that some read as children. You know, that 
if he insists on doing that, then he has to go into why a lot of people, you know, yeah, a, a lot of people look up to Superman and to an extent Batman. It shouldn't be canon that they're this messed up. It shouldn't be treated as being cool that they are. I'm not 100% certain how much I'm going to talk about Ayn Rand and how messed up she is and how messed up it is that Zack Snyder believes she's a genius. Ah, I'm, I'm probably just going to make some references, but yeah. I completely agree with those who say that when the DCEU is similar to the MCU that it's boring. I just don't agree that Zack Snyder is the right way for the DCU to go. You know, he has interesting ideas. He just, he clearly doesn't really believe that heroism is something that just comes naturally to anyone who has power. He feels like the heroes, the people who grew up reading in comic books look up to, must have started out as sociopaths and only just barely reached the point where they do heroic things. And when they do them, it's not that they believe it's the right thing. And that just really doesn't work for a cinematic universe predicated on heroes. I mean, seriously, doesn't it seem like he'd be much happier working on The Boys? I'm not saying that the DCU needs to focus, needs to only focus on heroes. As I already mentioned, I think that Birds of Prey Joker and the Suicide Squad are some of the very best of the DCU, but those are explicitly not about heroes. Why doesn't Zack Snyder just make movies about characters that aren't supposed to be heroes? Like, when he made Watchmen, it, you know, it's completely clear that when you watch that movie, you know, I can only speak to the theatrical cut, but in the theatrical cut, you know, he's by far the most interested in characters like Rorschach, the comedian, Dr. Manhattan, and I'm going to go with the antagonist, since I'm not spoiling the... Yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not spoiling Zack Snyder movies, I'm only spoiling DCU movies. You know, he really doesn't care that much about Night Owl or Sally Jupiter. And that movie can kind of, that, that movie can survive that kind of disinterest. You know, I, I think the movie would be better if you realize that Rorschach isn't supposed to be, like, we're not supposed to be rooting for Rorschach. You know, we're supposed to realize he's deeply messed up. He's, he's, he's not the biggest monster in that story, but he is kind of a monster. I really don't think that Snyder's DCU movies have been able to do that. You know, if you want to see a movie where a comic book character is going around killing a lot of people to get revenge in brutal ways, watch Punisher Warzone. That's what I do when I feel like watching a movie like that. You know, it's it's really high up on my, my list. I I love that movie. I'm not saying that you can't make movies like that. I'm just saying that movie doesn't pretend that like, that movie even raises the issue. It points out, you know, it has characters in there that point out, this is not heroic. This is not, like, you know, that's a movie that realizes that Frank Castle is a very messed up, disturbed individual. It's just that maybe he can also do something that, you know, maybe he can save lives. One of the things that bothers me about Snyder and his vision is the way that he worships characters who have abilities, you know, who have superhuman abilities. In his movies, these characters always have to be persuaded to do the right thing. They don't feel any obligation to do the right thing. You know, in the Avengers movies, the conflict isn't that, you know, ah, some of them, they don't really want to do the right thing. It's just, they're not sure what the exact right thing to do is. They, they disagree on the exact you know, best approach. And right there, we have interpersonal conflict. You can have interpersonal, you, you can have conflict in a movie like this, even if you, the characters in it are trying to do the right thing. Now, let's see. Yeah. Oh, spoilers for all of the MCU movies. I don't think there's a single time in an MCU movie where one of the heroes refuses to do the right thing Regardless of the emotional state that they're in, you know, there, there are some times where they're afraid that they will no longer be capable of doing the right thing, that what they do will make things worse. And obviously, I, I get that, you know, 
there are what did I write? I realized that there are right I realize there are characters in those movies who refuse to do the right thing but they aren't heroes or at least not at that time maybe they later reform anyway no more spoilers for MCU stuff I just, I, I'd like Zack Snyder's movies so much better if at least some of his superhuman uh, characters, let's see, who, who legitimately did not want to do the right thing were treated by the movies themselves as what they are, monsters. If you, you know, Stan Lee said that if you do the right thing, even if it's not easy, then you are a hero. If you have the ability to truly help people and you refuse for any other reason than that you think that you'll make things worse or something, yeah, you're, you're a monster. You're, you're going to let people suffer. I would watch a Zack Snyder horror movie about, like... You know, yeah, let's say, you know, a, a Superman who was raised without morals and was like, you know, I just don't want it to be, I don't want it to be treated as canon. I don't want it part of an ongoing kind of, you know what, if he, if his movies were focused on not creating the Justice League, but like creating a group of evil people who themselves believed to be heroes, but where the movie makes it clear they're monsters, I think that could be really interesting. I, I don't know. I don't know if he has the emotional maturity to handle something like that. He just, he seems mostly focused on these, yeah. I think I've pretty much said my hand. Anyway, it's not that I have a problem with dark stories. I love them. Some of my favorite movies are dark and or bleak. The Road, Monster, Mother, 1978 Halloween, The Thing, 1982, Escape from New York, The Matrix, American Remake of The Ring, yes, I know I should watch the original too, the Spanish movie Open Your Eyes, Street Kings, the German movie The Wave, The Piano Teacher, First Blood Part 1, the 1994 Shadow, Payback, both of Wes Craven's Nightmare on Elm Street films, the Roman Polanski, Rosemary's Baby, District 9, the, yeah, Joker, Prince of Darkness, They Live, Dark Man, A Simple Plan, Candyman 1992, Hellraiser 1, Logan. One thing, I hope this doesn't sound condescending, I really don't mean it to be, I just have to wonder if you watching this, if you love the Snyder Cut and you hated the theatrical, did you actually sit down and compare them or did you just remember that you were disappointed with the theatrical and when you watched this you didn't find yourself disappointed? Because I I just I think there are some places, some some major things where people who gave a negative review to the theatrical. I don't think the theatrical is good. I already mentioned it. it's a six out of ten. It's a it's a bad movie. It's it's. I just I don't think that this movie is that big of an improvement, other than the technical aspects and. Yeah. I also I have to wonder how many people how, how many like professional critics. I don't I don't like when people say oh professional critics they're paid off they're they. You know, if you disagree with them, that doesn't mean that they're paid to have a certain opinion. But I do have to wonder how many of them, like, were worried that they would get harassed by toxic Snyder Cut fans, you know, if they gave a negative review to this. Yeah. I'm not going to try to argue against all the things I've heard people say that are positive of this that I disagree with, you know. I've seen other people cover several of them. I won't spend to ever clearing up misunderstandings and misinformation regarding all the time between the theatrical cut of this and the release of this version. 
Renegade Cut did an excellent job covering it. I recommend his videos on the subject. The video made by Folding Ideas talking about the Snyder Cut is also great. I want to preface the following by saying I don't think that all fans of Snyder are terrible people. Not all of them cyber bullied people that they disagree with. My criticism of this film and of you know Zack Snyder isn't I'm not saying that you're a bad person if you like this if you like any movie that Snyder has made just if you if you feel like too many people don't notice the Snyder cut you know the the people going around using the hashtag Snyder cut release the Snyder cut long before it's well, yeah, before, obviously. Once it's been released, you don't really need to use that hashtag anymore. The the people who use that hashtag, not all of them are bad people. And if you're one of the, you know, if you're someone who didn't cyberbully people and you did use that hashtag, instead of trying to convince us that not all of you are bad, try to convince the ones who are bad to start treating other people better. That's that's how things get better. And I I think I think a strong argument like if if you're going to hate someone because of how the origin the, the theatrical cut came out, instead of hating critics who gave it a positive review or who didn't think that the Snyder cut was a good idea. Instead of hating them, hate the studio people and possibly Joss Whedon for accepting to take, you know, for taking the job. You know, the, yeah, the studio people who refused to give Zack Snyder time to grieve over one of his daughters and then used that as a, uh, what's the word, um, an excuse to change the movie that he was really passionate about making. And I, I do want to note, over the years since it's, uh, I believe the following is from Wikipedia, over the years since its inception, the release of the Snyder Cut movement has helped gain traction all the way to Warner Brothers executives and even through raising money for numerous tra charities associated with suicide prevention and awareness. That's great, but it doesn't undo online harassment. I don't think that the only way you can make a movie about Superman is that he doesn't want to do a good thing. I think you can make it work by saying that Superman, despite wanting to save people, isn't always, like, he, he can't save everyone, and that bothers him. Maybe, like, maybe have it be that he's worried like, when, when he tries to save someone, he's scared that he won't be able to save all of them. And, I mean, Man of Steel isn't about him not wanting to do the right thing. It's about him being scared of what will happen when people become aware that he exists. He clearly wants to help people. Like, when he saves people on the, uh, what's it called, oil rig, you know, he's he's not, he's doing that to save people. He's, he's not... You know, it, it really, it's it's only by Batman v Superman that, you know, that, that Snyder's Superman starts, like, seeming, you know, at, at, like, at times he's kind of neutral and disinterested in doing the right thing. At other times, he seems legitimately like he doesn't want to do the right thing. Honestly, I feel like many critics and regular film fans have expressed their opinion. We don't really agree with, you know, hardcore Snyder fans. Yeah, we want mature movies in this franchise, but it's not really Zack Snyder's vision, it's, it's others. We want more like The Suicide Squad, Birds of Prey, and, you know, Joker technically isn't the overall franchise, but yeah, Joker... 
we want more of of stuff like Joker. You know, didn't didn't Joker like set a new record for an R-rated movie, or was it an R-rated comic book? I forget the exact, but like clearly there is a there is a hunger for darker, more mature movies, but I mean the the kind of you know it, it nobody nobody forced critics to give negative reviews to Man of Steel and Batman v Superman. You know, that I'm I'm not gonna say that every single one of them is right about every single one of the things they said, but like the the what's the word C certainly a huge chunk of them they they make good points you know i i would say like i already mentioned i'm i'm a really big fan of of patty jenkins i'm not going to claim that wonder woman 1984 is a good movie just because i love just to support her I'm going to point out the mistakes made there so that she can learn and do better next time, you know. And again, I, I wouldn't be, like, once again, I love Monster and the first Wonder Woman solo movie. I'm not saying that she, like, honestly, if, if not for Wonder Woman 1984, I would have almost nothing negative to say about, you know, any any filmmaking decision she's ever made. Anyway. So, there are several major appeals of comic books and adaptations of them, stuff heavily inspired by them. One of them is it can have many wild concepts, have them play off each other. Magic power versus robots, for example, outside of comic books and their adaptations. You will only have a few of these at a time, and this one does that. And, let's see, another appeal, another major appeal with their wild concepts, they can give compelling commentary on real issues with greater f efficiency than non-comic stuff. Watch Lindsay Ellis' video essay, The Complex Fields of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. If you've watched both of the Guardians movies, if not, it's yeah. It's not you're you're not gonna have any any context for what she says. For excellent discussion of the exploration of emotional issues related to close relationships and the impact trauma from your family life can have on them. And th this movie does also do that. It does yeah. So, content warning and or trigger warning. This movie features the following, and I'm going to be discussing at least some of the following potentially triggering content. Vigilantism, torture, kidnapping, ableism, gaslighting, mental illness, xenophobia, murder, abuse of power, class struggles and grief and also please note I have a tendency to sometimes when I'm discussing a sensitive subject use descriptive terms that I consider neutral that other people consider negative so if I say something that sounds judgmental it may very well just be that I take for granted that people know I'm being descriptive not judgmental I'm not trying to be disrespectful and since there is swearing in the movie, there I, I might swear some in this video as well, for those bothered by that. This video is not going to contain any clips of any kind. Most visual gets is when I sometimes act something out, so feel free to watch something visual, such as clips from a movie. In another tab, I won't mind. So, anything negative I say in this video is not out of bitterness. I don't feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. It's not that I'm upset at how it compares to what it's adapting to other movies like it, what I was expecting, trailers and other marketing, earlier movies in the franchise, or other Zack Snyder movies. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it. To the best of my ability, the negative things I say in this are fair criticisms based on budget, when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. So in a lot of ways, this movie is like the theatrical cut. So I'm not going to mention all the things where they're similar. I'm going to talk about the ways that they are different from one another, so I'm not just repeating myself. Now, in order to watch, uh, yeah, in order to follow this movie's plot, you will have to have watched Man of Steel and Batman v Superman first. You don't really need to have watched. I guess, yeah, you don't you don't need to have watched 
Wonder Woman, the the first solo movie. You just need to know. Yeah, I'm I am spoiling this. You you need to know that Steve Trevor. Hold on, does that? Now that I think about it, is that in here or is that only the theatrical cut? Yeah, I in in most ways I I remember what's in this and what's in the theatrical cut. Anyway, and. You know, in in some ways, like the this movie does build on those, but you know the the fact that yeah the the fact that this movie is four hours long, it shouldn't need much like homework before you get into it. Now. Since we're still dealing with Corona, I want to say during this video, it's possible that I've touched my face. I think I already did earlier. I want to assure you, I washed my hands since the last time I was outside. I will wash my hands again before going out. So, this is my first viewing of this. Quite possible. It's, it's, it's very possible this will also be my last viewing. And I hit record not long after finishing watching. And, yeah, it's... I'm not just like frustrated with the movie because it's long. I there there are movies that are extremely long that I love. It's there are many other issues. It's only one of the problems with this. Now the reason I didn't do a video on this before now is I don't do streaming other than Disney Plus. I got this on Blu-ray once it was discounted, which you know I mean Let's see. It's been has it been a year or more? I'm I'm I forget exactly when it came out, but yeah. You know, there are movies that they wait substantially longer before they discount them, but anyway. I will say I I appreciate that they did put it out on home release that you don't have to have HBO Max because I'm almost like As much as I love The Suicide Squad, even something like the Peacemaker miniseries, I'm almost definitely never going to get HBO Max. Especially considering that this was, like, I think it might have been Movie Bob who pointed out part of the reason the Snyder Cut got made and that it's this long is because HBO Max wants to have a chance, a fighting chance, in the streaming wars. So, the plot. Following the events of Batman v Superman, Superman's death awakens the three mother boxes, which attracts Steppenwolf, who seeks to use them, and I'm going to just say they, to have a destructive impact on Earth. Can Batman and Wonder Woman assemble the team teased in BVS in time to stop him? Now, I really appreciate that, you know, there is some, like, the, the characters on the same team, like, they do combo attacks, although, you know, I, I forget who it was that said, you know, they do that in this, but not in the theatrical, they, they do a little bit in the theatrical cut, not, not as much, and not as, anyway, there, or, uh, let me think. Combo attacks. Yeah, yeah, a little a little bit. And anyway. So there is some at least in both. And I would say the movie tries to have compelling interpersonal conflicts between them, and certainly it's a good idea for that kind of thing to be in this, but I mean it's mostly just that they're whining about having to do the right thing. It's like it's like listening to a a seven-year-old who doesn't want to eat his vegetables or something just for crying out loud and let's see does the movie explain why there isn't assistance or at least more assistance by military or the like why it is only the vigilantes fighting the villain and if not should there be I mean I feel like the honestly like Man of Steel had the military engage, and I, I mean, they didn't do that much, they didn't help that much, they didn't end up doing that much, you know, that make that much of a difference, but it kind of feels like the only reason the military isn't in this 
when they were in that is the the whole like for for that movie they got I want to say subsidies is what you get if you if you get the if you have the American military in your American movie and you show them in a positive light it's also kind of telling that that movie got approved for that considering that they the, the American military actually attacks Superman but I guess they didn't think that that was that bad of a thing like they they shoot when when he you know when when he's standing there and he he gets hit by some of the I mean okay so yeah his skin can take it but it's still like yeah I don't know I guess they didn't the the American military didn't think well you know I mean if he looks kind of different I guess we we would we'll probably won't attack him fair enough good point like if if this was the first to not have military then I'd be like yeah I mean what are they gonna do but because it's like let's see Batman v Superman yeah Man of Steel is the only of these that of of the these three that don't have that but yeah anyway so the um, Right, and yeah, for those who don't know, I watch and video review pretty much every single comic book adaptation movie that goes to theaters or, like, you know, the, the in, in this case, gets a home release. And I honestly, before I watched this, I did think that there was a, like, when, when I watched the theatrical cut, I was like, wow. I don't know, like, Snyder definitely could have done a better job, and now watching this, like, I mean, okay, in some ways he did, but anyway. I do appreciate that at times this movie is legitimately like a horror movie. Like, there, there are a couple of bits in this that you could, like, if you show those scenes to some, th those bits to someone who didn't know the, the overall continuity, they would think they were watching parts of a horror movie. I, you know, I th I think I I like when these go a little beyond, like, you know, th for for a while there was a certain image of what a comic book movie was. You know, that's the kind of thing. Like, if you if you watch, which you probably, you know. Honestly, you shouldn't. But if you do watch the the ah, uh, what are they called again? Fantastic, yeah the the two Fantastic Four movies with Chris Evans. You know, I'm really glad he kept getting chances to play a superhero because yeah, I mean he he plays the part. It's the characters like he is in the comics. He's just he's super annoying there as well. Anyway. Those used to be what people expected when there was a comic book adaptation, but this having, you know, this and others having scenes that feel like they're out of a horror movie, that's, I, I really like that. And it it's epic. Let's see. And... Yeah, I... I forget what critic, but but a fellow critic said essentially the movie is the same as the theatrical cut. It's just that you know some some aspects of it have more depth, and it's overly long. It it feels like a director's cut or a special edition, and, and you know one person said it feels like they just stuck all the deleted scenes in, you know, and. I think it might have been Steve Shives who said it feels like they finished the special effects on the assembly cut. And yeah, that is very much. And, and you know, assembly cut, Renegade cut does an excellent job explaining what an assembly cut is. And this video is already getting way too long. Anyway. So, yeah, some of the things I say in the review itself, I won't be able to get into details on until I get to the thoughts sections with spoilers. So, 
yeah, the the writing, the yeah. So this was written by Zack Snyder himself, Chris Terrio, Will Will Beal. Yeah, and everybody else listed on IMDb as writer is, you know, created some of the characters we like. So, Snyder, the other movies I've watched that he has written something for, you know, other than, than this, there is the 2017 Justice League, the Wonder Woman, the first Wonder Woman solo movie, where he wrote the story. He wrote the screenplay for 300 Rise of an Empire. That's, yeah... I mean, for sure there are things in that. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, he wrote the screenplay and story for Sucker Punch, and he wrote the screenplay for 300. But, you know, I mentioned earlier, he didn't he didn't come up with it out of whole cloth. He built on the foundation that Frank Miller built. And Frank Miller, despite sometimes really going out there, he, you know, some of his artwork and writing is absolutely incredible. And, yeah, Chris Terrio wrote the screenplay and story. He also wrote screenplay and story for the 2017 one. He wrote Batman v Superman and wrote the screenplay for Argo. And Will Beale also wrote... He wrote the story for this, and he wrote the screenplay and story for Aquaman, the solo movie. I can't help but... I, th I think the movie might have been helped by renaming some of the comic book named items. I think Mother Boxes being called Creation Engines. You know, they, they do refer to them at least once as that. I think that would have made it easier to swallow for a lot of mainstream audiences. And, yeah, so there are a number of aspects where some of the scenes in Whedon's version... <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, the theatrical cut is better than, or, yeah, this, those scenes are better than in the Snyder Cut. And, yeah, I already mentioned the only movie that Zack Snyder had, oh, actually, yeah, that's right. The only movie that Zack Snyder has either written or directed that I haven't watched yet is The Owls of Gahul. Because, yeah, the movies he's written, I have watched, yeah. Movies by, written by Joss Whedon that I've seen are both of the first two Avengers movies, the theatrical cut of this, where he rewrote some scenes, Cabin in the Woods and Alien Resurrection. I love all four of those, though I agree that Alien Resurrection isn't exactly what he wanted after, after you know, it's not what we wanted after at least the first two Alien movies. And, you know, Whedon himself says that was not the way, like, it's supposed to be like tongue-in-cheek, and they read it completely like, um, they played it straight and that didn't work. I think it's, I, I mean, I think Alien Resurrection almost kind of works as like a parody of the first two movies. It's like, uh, if, if you, yeah, anyway. And I, let's see, yeah, and, and I haven't watched the shows that Whedon has created and or written for yet. I do, I, I own both Buffy and Angel, and I I do intend to watch them down the line. Really, right now, the, the reason I'm not watching them is because my, my back means that I have to be careful about how much I sit and watch and, like, take notes for. And I really want to do videos talking about those shows and the individual episodes the way I have done for other shows. Based on these examples, I have to say, I think Joss Whedon is just a much better writer than Snyder is. I'm not saying that the theatrical cut is good overall, mainly that a number of the scenes that are different are better handled than in this. It really seems to me like Joss Whedon did as much as he could to fix it. He was brought in fairly late. I think if he'd written the movie from the start, it would have been significantly better than either cut we have now. Zack Snyder's strengths are in his visuals, the way he films and edits scenes. That's where he is a superior filmmaker to Joss Whedon. The movie he's directed with the best writing are the ones with the writing at least partially done by other people, 300 and Watchmen. The good writing of those movies was mostly there in the comics they were based on, and the good things he added are visual. 300 has more outlandish creatures, Watchmen has the opening credits montage, the... 
the the coding of one of the characters as being gay as if there was something wrong with that notwithstanding I'm not saying that every director has to also be a great writer I'm saying that if you're a director who's not a good writer you should have the self-awareness to admit that and bring in people who write scenes and movies that you want to direct both of them at their best clearly understand the characters from the comics and how to make them work in a film. But Snyder doesn't want to deal with characters that don't align with his Ayn Randian views. And that makes these movies much worse than otherwise. And I, uh, there was a thing that I didn't get it written down. I'll, I, I won't spend forever trying to remember it. Let's see. It was that the... Right, right. I, um, example. I, uh, I do not remember exactly what the... There's a, there's a writing duo who has written... I, I believe this duo wrote all four of the MCU movies that the Russo brothers directed. And all four of those movies are well-written and well-directed. You know, they, they, they're they written in ways that clearly work with what the Russos want to put on the screen. So, you know, I wish... I do. I hope that Zack Snyder finds someone who can be to, to you know, to, to Zack Snyder's directing what the that writing duo were to the Russo brothers MCU directing and just write something that he really and, and I hope I, I I want him to stop trying to franchise build because he's I really don't think he's good at or if he's going to franchise build I think it needs to be with something where he can make the the quote unquote heroes bad guys because that is clearly what he prefers to do. Now, I don't think that the lighter tone was a flaw of the theatrical, though I do understand those who were frustrated with it, and I definitely agree that it's inconsistent with the DCU leading up to it. But the fact that this movie isn't as light and is indeed much darker than theatrical in a number of ways. Don't make it a better movie, just more of a Zack Snyder film. On the one hand, I think people need to give Warner Brothers a break that they didn't want to keep throwing away hundreds of millions of dollars on movies that were negatively received. But on the other, Warner Brothers, what were you thinking? Did you really think that, you know, like, on... Did, did you really think that the kind of dark, broody, dreary, bleak movies that Zack Snyder makes would be as effectively crowd-pleasing as the MCU? Because that's what they were... They wanted to compete with the MCU. Like, if they just wanted to, to provide something that was compelling and maybe an alternative to the MCU, then, you know, there, there wouldn't really be much of a problem there, but they wanted you know, they wanted that kind of franchise success. And, of course, that's not going to happen with Zack Snyder's, like... I mean, for, for the first... Let's see, the... the Yeah, the first, first two movies in the DCU are Snyder and Batman v Superman, especially, like, it is, it is completely drenched in his worldview. Of course, that's not going to... Like... I respectfully disagree that it is of of I I think it's it's I can I can understand an argument that it's more interesting than something that's just crowd pleasing and nothing else that where there isn't some kind of you know but I don't really think that the MCU has a big problem with not like is there an MCU movie that doesn't have something to say that isn't just the the this kind of like roller coaster you know I want to say Martin Scorsese said that they're more like roller coasters than real movies I mean I I no there isn't there's no no MCU movie and no Disney Plus MCU show is just about entertainment there's there's always something there for you to think about, for you to take away from it. So, like, you know, let's say that this was, you know, 
Ah, let me think. Uh, something that really doesn't have anything to say, that's just trying to entertain people. I mean, I think I would, I would argue that some of Paul W. Anderson's movies, which are, you know, they're, they're never good, but they can be entertaining to watch as long as you're in the right mindset. I would say he's mostly interested. He's, he's interested in entertaining, but he's not... He's not always interested in making people think. I would say that Batman v Superman is more interesting than a Paul W. Anderson movie that just wants to entertain you. But I don't think that Batman v Superman is superior to, you know, the, the yeah, something out of the MCU, for example. Like, if you if you just want something dark, once again... The Boys, and there's also that, there was a, uh, I don't remember what it's called, but there was one other thing where it's like an evil Justice League, and it's like animated, and I saw some videos about it, it you know, like, you don't have to look that hard for these kinds of things, like, I could understand if there was just nothing, and I get wanting Snyder to keep making these movies, and I, I think if he just, if he either makes ones where... Like, the point is that the heroes are evil, or if he stops making, like, franchise ones, you know, like, if, if you just sit down and watch, you know, his, his movies in general, like, so, yeah, Dawn of the Dead, 300, which wasn't meant to have a sequel at first, Watchmen, yeah, you know, they, they're some of the most effective you know he he really goes all out he's not holding back because he he thinks that he had, i i'm not saying that he's not thinking about stories down the line actually if anything i think he's way too obsessed with like he really wants to do a movie where superman is evil and he keeps just trying to build to that instead of focusing on making the movie he's currently making actually be well written at the end of the day, either cut of this is a bland story with too much exposition and a lot of choices made by both the writer and the characters that make the movie worse than it had to be. In this movie, it like in this cut of the movie, it seems like Snyder isn't even capable of telling a story without a lot of exposition. I would say that he does he does a good job in some of the other movies, but I don't know, I mean I guess it's it's possible then that the most exposition heavy stuff in this it's like stuff that ah, he wanted to film something visual for it but he was replaced by Whedon and you know like basically Whedon didn't film the stuff that Warner Brothers didn't think would go in the movie so, you know, and, and maybe there wasn't budget, maybe it wasn't in the budget to film the, those scenes once they were just making the Snyder Cut itself. But it just, it still comes across as sloppy. And at the end of the day, I really don't think, like, when you... I want to say it was... I have his name right on the tip of my tongue. Car no, not Carlton Hughes, right? Uh, da Damon Lindelof. Damon Lindelof, when he wrote the pilot for Lost, he apparently didn't know how he was going to follow it up. And like once he heard that it was followed up, he was like really scared that, you know, what, what am I going to do? And I empathize. I, I always empathize with people who are feeling like if, if you're feeling scared, if, if that, you know, anxiety, like that's it's incredibly painful and it can be very difficult to to cope with. But I don't think you should write something like that if you don't know how you're going to follow it up. Like if you if you have that kind of opportunity, think of how many people have countless hours of stories to tell. We're never going to get that chance. 
give them that chance instead. Like, just, like have them write it, hand it in their name, and then once it's accepted, say, psych, it was actually this other person. Now, you either have to hire them, or the rest of the show is going to be crap. When Snyder sat down to make the Snyder Cut, he agreed that he would be able to make a better movie than the theatrical cut. And I don't think he did. Now, yeah, considering the fact that ultimately the movie is very similar to the theatrical cut, it is honestly unforgivable that it is this long, that it takes this long to get through the same average, bland plot. The movie is essentially a director's cut or special edition, like the director's cut of the 2003 Daredevil or, you know, one of the first four Alien movies. Not really a different movie, just there's much, there, there's more depth, which is fine if you think the movie was close to being great or if you do like it and want more of the movie, but, you know, more more of the, the vision of the movie, the original vision, but if you think that the original movie was average, then unless you're a diehard Snyder fan, you're probably not going to be satisfied with including all the deleted scenes and changing the tone to be snyder -y. I mean, yes, I haven't watched that much of Batman v Superman Ultimate Edition, purely because the library version stopped working, but that one, it is a really big difference. The Ultimate Edition explains the plot much, much better, and that was also Zack Snyder, so he is capable of doing it. Like, again, if this was some... You know, if, if we didn't have high expectations of Snyder, then it would be like, oh, well, okay, I guess. But we know he can do better than this. If your problem with the theatrical cut was that it had color, light, and quips, that it wasn't bleak and sad, then yeah, you'll be happy with this one. A number of people point out that when Zack Snyder made this movie, Warner Brothers was telling him, you have to make a team of movie now. No, you cannot wait for more solo movies to come out. So it's not quite fair to compare this movie, either cut of it, to any Avengers movie. Uh, except, I don't know, maybe the Yuma Thurman one? I haven't watched that one. I Anyway. But the... You know, I, I would also say that this one does a worse job than... You know, the, the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie is great. And that one also did not have any solo movies before. In, in fact, the only characters in that movie that had appeared before that movie are Thanos, the Collector, and his slave girl, none of whom had very much screen time. That movie does a far better job of tying the characters into the main plot, making them connected to each other than this movie does. It's hard to overstate how easily this movie could tie every single main character into the Mother Boxes plot. Arthur feels it's his responsibility as an Atlantean from Sooner, Diana for Amazonian Sooner, Cyborg and Barry to spare others the tragedy they themselves faced. You know, Batman is already tied to the Mother Boxes plot. Just, if only, oh, if only Zack Snyder didn't hate the ideas, the idea of superheroes actually feeling like being superheroes. If they didn't have to be dragged kicking and screaming into doing the right thing. If that's how you view superheroes, fine. But why are you ruining movies that could be good? With that view, just sit back and let other people make these films. Because Zack Snyder is not that good of a screenwriter. Oh, that's yeah, th that's right. The the yeah. So what I was mentioning before. Yeah, he needs to find one or more people who can write the script, the screenplay that he wants to direct, where it works out well, where they reflect each other's perceptions of how the movie should end up looking. Like the duo who writes the screenplays that the Russo brothers direct when they make MCU movies. And the duo is called Christopher Marcus and Stephen McFeely. I forgot that I wrote it elsewhere in my notes. As a screenwriter, Zack Snyder is bad at characterization and general psychology, story structure, dialogue, plotting, and storytelling. It went well when he worked with Frank Miller for 300. I don't know, that guy has completely left the reservation by now, even by conservative standards. He's stopped making any sense. So it's not going to be him. Cosmonaut Variety Hour did a really great job, you know, he made the following point. Zack Snyder doesn't understand Watchmen or Superman or Batman, and he doesn't want to make movies that are accurate adaptations of the source material. He wants to make edgelord fan fiction. He's a frat bro. And, yeah, 
that's that's exactly it that's exactly the problem and you know I get that it's also why some people love it so the the handling of plot twists I don't think there are too many plot twists I don't think there are too few let's see if you went into this not knowing the theatrical cut I don't think you'd have an easy time figuring them out now some of the plot twists are bad and you know this is one of those movies that like when you some, some of the twists when you learn the twist the movie completely falls apart you know actually yeah actually the the I want to say YMS you know when when Adam Johnston what I think that's how you pronounce his name um, anyway yeah when when he made his review of this of, of the Snyder Cut he pointed out he hasn't watched the theatrical cut and you know so he's not going in trying to compare it to yeah and yeah if you don't compare it to yeah right my point is he also you know he still didn't think that it was a good movie now so the yeah the direction yeah you know so yeah I watched the theatrical cut Batman v Superman Man of Steel Sucker Punch Watchmen 300 and Dawn of the Dead the only I haven't watched that he's directed are Legends of the Guardians the Owls of Cahool and I mean for sure the 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 visuals are stronger in this and yeah one critic said the movie's very self-indulgent every shot is Zack's favorite shot 10% of the film is slow-mo literally someone did the math a number of scenes go on for far too long you can really tell they either told Zack make it as long as you want or they might have outright told him make it as long as absolutely possible because we really need people to sign up and stay on this streaming service it would be very like if I understand correctly on the streaming service there's like a black and white version of this also and it's like look I really don't see how that could possibly make it that much more you're gonna, you're gonna watch another four hours just because it's black and white instead of the the what little color Snyder approves of there being in his movies I it's it's just supposed to drive up the the streaming number anyway it would be very easy to trim at least 30 maybe 60 minutes out of this movie where it would just make it a better movie where you wouldn't have to lose like plot there's no reason for this to be the length of two movies or a miniseries and I say that as someone who loves miniseries some stories need that amount of time every MCU Disney Plus show that's come out whether it's the entire show or just the first season by the time I record this video so WandaVision, The Falcon, The Winter Soldier, Loki what if all of them used the time really well telling stories there's no way they could have gotten down to gotten down to two or even three hours and I do think it's pretty ridiculous to claim that it works as a miniseries. I forget if it was Snack Snyder who did that or if it was Studio or someone else. That you can watch it as a miniseries for the pacing to work for that. I'm not the first person to point out. If you take the six chapters of this and watch them one at a time. Like it's clearly made, made to be watched in a single sitting. Like it, it doesn't... Like if you watch an actual miniseries, like the story starts at the start of the episode, moves across the episode, comes to a, uh, comes to like a, what's it called? Like it gets extremely interesting and then either resolves or and and leads into the next one or it ends on a cliffhanger and then the next episode starts and slowly gets up. But but this it's paced like a movie. You know, if you sit and watch it in four hours, yeah, it's yeah. And, and four hours with this amount of bloat, it's absolutely ridiculous. Just compare it to the 
Uh, let's see. Yeah, the the MCU Disney Plus shows, some of them have more than one season, but all of them have short seasons and work as miniseries pacing-wise. Sure, you can binge, but if you, want one, if you watch one episode at a time the way that they're released, you will get a full episode with plot and character beats. Before the Snyder Cut was a reality, excellent YouTuber Renegade Cut pointed out that the Snyder Cut did not exist as a finished film. They might have an assembly cut, but it would need a lot of work before it worked as a finished film, in addition to finishing special effects and such. And I kind of already said that early in this video, I forgot that I put it twice in my notes. I guess they just finished the special effects and released the assembly cut. They, you know what? I would have loved, I would have really respected Warner Brothers if they released this four-hour monstrosity and called it Justice League The Assembly Cut. I would really respect their honesty for that. The bloat is ridiculous. Hitchcock once said that drama is life with the boring parts cut out. Zack Snyder evidently said, if I don't include every single scene of people walking, how will I possibly make this thing four hours long? Don't get me wrong, I love the Lord of the Rings extended editions. I love Avengers Endgame, but those movies don't feel bloated. Honestly, if Snyder has to make a four hour movie, I'd be much more interested in something like 300. Sorry, that got overly emotional. Now, let's see. Yeah, so, you know, some of the changes did lead to better scenes. A few times the scenes were worse. He removed the Superman is gone, people are treating others worse sequence with its music, which very much felt like a Zack Snyder scene. So removing it actively makes the movie worse. Wait, removing it actively makes the movie worse, not because it felt like a Snyder scene. A number of times the difference between the theatrical and this make the movie worse than the theatrical cut. There's a quote about how Christopher Nolan and Deborah Snyder didn't want Zack Snyder to watch the theatrical cut. Uh, you know, that, that was before he made his own cut. I have to wonder if he just did not watch the theatrical cut, and that's why he didn't adopt any of Joss Whedon's fixes or Maybe he's just too proud to admit that some of them are better. Like, there are a couple of parts where literally, I, I, I forget which, some, someone pointed out that there are a couple of bits in, in this movie where, like, if you watch it, you know, watching the Snyder Cut, like, if you think back to the theatrical cut, like, Whedon had that bit in there, but then he had another character say, well, wait a second, that doesn't make sense, because, yeah, you know, and look, if you want to say that's petty, I'm not going to argue with you. I get, like, <laughs> yeah, that's petty. That's Joss Whedon being petty. But that's not necessarily Joss Whedon being factually, objectively incorrect. So the opening does a pretty good... Like, it, it definitely sets up the rest of the movie both, like, it you know, for, for bloat, for story, and, uh, yeah. I'm not going to give away whether the ending is happy or sad, but I will say it fits what came before. And, I mean, the movie's ending, I think there are some good things to it, but... Like, there are definitely big problems with the ending of this movie that are not there in the theatrical. Let's see. Deus Ex Machina, convenient writing. Not really, no. Not, not with the ending. Other parts of the movie have convenient writing. And... I mean, technically... Technically, this doesn't really have a post credit scene. It, it has something that could have been a post credit scene, but it just puts it at the very end of the movie, before the end credits start. And... I would definitely say it's a movie that loses your interest several times along the way, because scenes just go on and on without... just... without going anywhere new. Like... Yeah. 
I I think I could imagine like for for some people some some people might like this movie more if they never watched the theatrical cut. But the for for sure like if you already watched the theatrical cut and then you try to watch this like it's just I mean he just put new stuff in but he didn't change like so many of the things that in 2017 people said this is terrible writing what did Joss Whedon do and now we see it's like no that was that was Zack Snyder that was absolutely Zack Snyder who did that and Joss Whedon just did what he could to fix it and I do not say the following lightly because I was rooting for Zack. Not the Australian sense of the word, but there are times in this movie where he clearly doesn't know how to balance all the heroes getting, you know, getting, yeah, getting something to do. And we end up in X Men movie territory. One of my only major problems with even the best X Men movies, some heroes just stand around. And, you know, in the case of this movie, sometimes not standing around, but certainly not using their powers not using their powers because the writers couldn't figure out a way for them to use their powers either without completely solving the situation on their own or for them to combine their forces with other heroes which is the fundamental appeal of a superhero or supervillain team if you cannot do that well then you should not be making these kinds of movies and let's see, you know, of course, we did already know that sometimes Zack Snyder favors a longer action scene over smart characters using the powers at their disposal while doing well. Something pointed out really well in the editing room abridged script of Batman v Superman about the title fight. I will definitely say I, there is not a single scene in this that is as just ridiculously poorly thought out. Like in this, they are trying to be tactical, which. I wonder if that was maybe Warner Brothers who was like, you know, they, they were like, look, people watched the, like, it really is. Honestly, I have a hard time understanding how people can still be fans of Zack Snyder after watching the, yeah, Batman v Superman when the two of them are fighting all the mistakes that, that Batman makes when the appeal of his character is that he plans these kind of, like, he has a detailed plan for how to take out the the you know yeah anyway no this has nothing as as bad as that so the cast the let's see yeah ben affleck as bruce wayne's batman Yeah, uh, Zack Snyder described Affleck's Batman as on a path of redemption in this movie, feeling guilty due to his actions in Batman v Superman. And he and Barry are basically the only of the main heroes who, even from the start of the film, express a strong desire to be in the Justice League, even though Diana is already out there being hero. And Bruce is trying to bring together the Justice League. And... Amy Adams as Lois Lane. On the one hand, I really appreciate that the movie depicts grieving, something we all have to go through at least, you know, at some point in our lives, even if not for a friend or family member, at least a pet, something. And there are not enough depictions of healthy grieving in the media. But it's kind of sad that this is all Zack Snyder can think of to have a award-winning actress Amy Adams do obsess over Superman three movies in a row because Zack doesn't like women and give them very little to do in his movies one critic said that her character could be a mop with a sad emoji taped to it and it's 100% true it's it's like again if you love this movie compare it to the the theatrical cut where she is yeah i right i am yeah i am spoiling the theatrical cut in that movie she 
feels like more of an actual character. She's, there's still not that much to her, but it's, yeah. And again, I, I'm not saying that if, like, if you, if, if grief really destroys you, if you, if, if you are barely yourself because of grief, I'm not saying that that, like, makes you weak or something, but it's not, again, if this was the first movie, if this was the first we saw of this character and it wasn't Lois Lane who's such a compelling like she's she's such a driven smart character in the comics you know then it it wouldn't be a problem but it's like he he feels like he has to prove that you know his his world view is is true so he writes these characters in these really insulting ways Now, yeah, Gal Gadot as Diana Prince slash Wonder Woman. The, yeah, in, in, I will say that the, you know, the, the, some of the worst stuff relating to her in the theatrical cut is gone. And the, you know, the, the camera isn't objectifying her as frequently, but it is still a problem. And, you know, I've, I've seen some people say that, oh, you know, now it's completely, no, it isn't. Plenty of it is still present. And this is still, you know, the, the, the Amazon, the Amazonians are still made like sexier in this. And Ray Fisher as Victor Stone slash Cyborg. And I guess, yeah, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna spoil anything. So yeah, Wikipedia, much of Cyborg's character well was removed in the theatrical release. And Snyder described Cyborg as is depicted in this movie as the heart of the movie. Similarly, Fisher stated that Cyborg's character arc is emotional and allegorical of the journey that black people have taken in America. And let's see. Yeah, and the let's see. Yeah, and I, I think it was Steve Shives who pointed out, you know, Cyborg gets more screen time, which, you know, that should lead to more depth, but he just gets a lot of exposition to deliver, not that much more character development, and yeah, like, I, 100%, I understand why Ray Fisher was frustrated, because he gives an incredible performance in this and it was butchered in the theatrical cut, and that is, and and it's especially awful. This is the one black guy in who plays a really main character in the movie, and they just removed so much of like Ray Fisher put his heart and soul into this performance, and it's really insulting that like you know what honestly me if I was at Warner Brothers. I would have released all the stuff that it had, you know, just just release them as deleted scenes, like like not not like the the kind with like unfinished special effects and such, but just like finish the special effects and and release them, you know, maybe on like DVD or Blu-ray or something. Don't just not. It, it's like he he really did an incredible job. And I wish that it led to him, like, yeah. I, I wish that it, yeah, I've, I, would, I would just be repeating myself. I'm going to move on. The, the, ah, uh, what was the, what was the other thing? There was something, let's see, right, right. You know, the, the, if, 
if not for all of the 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 if not for all of the um, exposition that Cyborg delivers, you know, Diana would have even more exposition to deliver, which in both of these cuts, that's like, she doesn't get to do that much more than that. Which, like, I get, I, I've, you know, Joss Whedon is racist, and that's part of why there's so little cyborg in the theatrical cut, and I'm not going to defend that, but it kind of seems like Zack Snyder doesn't think very highly of the minorities in his, like, the, the female main character and the black main character deliver exposition. That's, that's not, like, you know, he is capable of, of giving, you know, of, of putting a lot of, of there being a lot of material for his main characters, but yeah, it's not usually for the, the female ones, other than, obviously, Sucker Punch, since most of the characters in that are female. Now, and right, and, and Jason Momoa as Arthur Curry slash Aquaman, and... Let's see the yeah yeah when we first meet him he's upset because Atlanteans tell him what to do he thinks Bruce would too he helps ensure this one Finnish town gets a lot of fish because their fishing sometimes isn't successful and people in dangerous storms but he refuses to help his suffering people yeah. And let's see. Yeah, one critic points out, you know, Aquaman now has heartfelt conversations with multiple characters, including Victor Stone. He's no longer just the a hole of the group. And Ezra, Ezra Miller as Barry Allen slash The Flash. He jumps at the chance to join the Justice League because he needs friends. Friends, his super speed makes it difficult for him to relate to other people. And yeah, he's one of the comic relief characters, and as such, people some people will feel he is annoying and that the film goes too far to get laughs out of him. And one critic says he's still the comic relief, but he's now also a character, and that is true. I honestly thought that Snyder would tone down Barry Allen, but he didn't tone him down all that much, and some of it could easily have been trimmed, at, at least trimmed down, toned down. A lot of us guessed that Joss Whedon was the one who made him so, so ADHD and quippy, but either those were written by Zack Snyder, or he didn't mind them enough to change them. Yeah, actually, I read that Snyder said that he didn't, that no scenes in this were direct, written or directed by Joss Whedon, so... Yeah, like, and he added some that are not in the theatrical cut. Some of some of the worst comic relief that is about Barry in either of these cuts is Snyder's, and some of the worst is in this cut. Uh, let's see. Yeah, you know, he, he added stuff that are not in the theatrical cut that feel like the lines by Barry could have been written by Joss Whedon. Second favorite chair, still there. Snack hole, still there. Brunch, gone, thank goodness. But that was still a lot to leave in. And another pretty point out, the Flash doesn't feel like he fits with the rest of Zack Snyder's tone. And... Now, Kiaren Hines still plays Steppenwolf, and let's see. Yeah, he he feels like a big deal. Where you know the the like Joss Whedon 
in the theatrical cut of, of this and the two Avengers movies he directed, you know, he, he doesn't, like, he, he lets, ah, his villains get very quippy and get, like, made fun of and humiliated and such, and, yeah, that's, that's not, that's not, n nowhere near, a, that's not really a problem Snyder has. Something I criticized the theatrical cut for was that the collection of the mother boxes was infinitely less emotionally complex and compelling than Infinity War, and while I realize it could be argued that it's unreasonable to expect, expect the Snyder Cut to fix that, I do, do still want to note, it really doesn't. Like, yeah. This movie came out after Infinity War, after Endgame. I, I really don't understand why people f think this cut is, is satisfying. I, I'm going to move on. And let's see. Not a huge surprise, but Darkseid is not remotely as complex as Thanos. I'm not saying he shouldn't be a monster. Thanos is a monster. You understand where he's coming from, but he's a monster. And yes, in the comics, Darkseid was introduced before Thanos was, but Snyder, or whomever, did decide to, or at least to stick to the plan, and build to Darkseid in 2015, after it was clear that Thanos was going to be a big deal in the MCU in 2012. So, of course, we're going to make these comparisons. And again, just like, if you cannot deliver something incredible there, just you know, like, there are other DC villains. It, it really did not have to be. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. Like, when the movie... I uh, I feel almost certain that I watched it in 2015, but apparently IMDb says that Batman v Superman re was released theatrical in 2016. So let's go, you know, either way. 2012 revealed that... Thanos was going to be a big deal. The fact that anyone decided to still... I, I don't know if it's Snyder. It might have been someone else who said he had to. But they made the decision that they were going to, you know, put the... Like, Darkseid and Thanos have so many similarities. You know, so they were basically saying, we're also going to do this character which is essentially saying that they can do better you know no, nobody enters into like if 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 you have if you have a competition going and one person is like you know i can let's say i can lift a hundred pounds you know, if someone else comes in and says, oh, yeah, well, I can, they're not going to say lift 75 pounds. They're going to say 125 pounds or something. You know, you don't throw your hat in the ring. You throw your towel in the ring if you think that you can't do better. So clearly they thought they could do better, and I'm not that surprised, but they couldn't. And it's just, again, I'm not, you know, it's possible this wasn't Zack Snyder's decision. And... You know, in, in that case, I completely understand, you know, being frustrated with and, and stuck with, but as far as I understand, nobody forced him to stick with Darkseid for this movie. He could have just made it a different character. Like, the theatrical cut, yeah, again, I'm, I'm spoiling the DCU leading up to this. In the theatrical cut, Darkseid never shows up. He, is he even, ref I don't, I'm not sure he's even named even once in that entire movie. So you can make this movie completely without Darkseid, and when Snyder made this, he decided, no, Darkseid is going to be in this. But there's no good reason for him to be. And, yeah. Moving on. So, let's see. Yeah, some say that it's uh, the movie is a slow burn. It's not in a hurry jumping from one action scene to the other. It's more character-driven. Cyborg especially, much more interesting than in the theatrical cut. 
Diana knows a lot about the villains, the Amazonian knowledge, so she is unfortunately busy delivering exposition for a lot of her screen time. She is good in the action scenes, though. There's too much fan service. Some characters are out for revenge. And, right, Steve Shives points out heroes in Zack Snyder films are always posing, waiting for the right moment to, you know, join a, join a fight, go in and save people. Not, you know, not minding standing back and letting people die. And, yeah, you know, there are some issues due to having to introduce Aquaman, Cyborg, and The Flash, since they hadn't appeared in the movies before this. Many of the better character moments are in the theatrical cut, not Snyder, the Snyder cut. And there are a lot of things in the theatrical cut that humanizes the characters that I guess Snyder didn't like. And there are a bunch of things that in the Snyder cut, there's, you know, either the setup or the payoff, you know, like, yeah, the, the, yeah, the setup... The theatrical cut has both setup and payoff to it, but in the Snyder cut, either the setup is gone or the payoff is. And I don't understand, like, at times it almost feels like Snyder is just, like, he's, he's, he doesn't want to put in as much effort as he could. He feels really insulted that the movie was taken away from him, so he doesn't feel like he has to make the best movie he can. It's just, yeah. And... Right, so, the dialogue. The dialogue is not as... Right, quoting a fellow critic here, the di dialogue is not as slick as Joss Whedon's. It is instead very clunky and expositional. It takes a long time to say things that we already know. Very exposition happy movie. I will say I always appreciate when a comic book adaptation movie finds a way to work in some narration, maybe in some monologuing, and you you know, we, we get some really great stuff with that in this, which isn't really surprising since we get both of those in you know, in in three hundred, which Zack Snyder also directed, and there it also works incredibly well. So the cinematography was handled by Fabian Wagner, and yeah, he DP'd a bunch of TV stuff, I don't know, and, you know, the, the theatrical cut. And, let's see. I understand the appeal of muted colors, I like it for 300. But it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me when the heroes are so distinct. In the comics, the costumes of Wonder Woman and Batman should look extremely different from each other. But because of the muted colors, they don't. And quoting some fellow critics here, Every setting is filmed like it's the most imp important place. Every scene is filmed like it's the most important scene. It gets exhausting to watch. Muted colors, bad color grading. Crisp cinematography, enthralling cinematography, award-worthy cinematography, and overly showy, gloomy cinematography. For better or worse, Justice League is still a Zack Snyder film with that Wagyu fat of personal excesses. When he says action, cinematographer Fabian Wagner asks how dark and how slow in a regrettably truncated 133-1. TV screen aspect ratio that clips space and or, right, that was that was this didn't may didn't mean to end the sentence there because that was still an ongoing sentence. The director's penchant for overwashed color palettes and repetitive slow motion is alive and well in and, uh, yeah, as an acquired audience taste. The overuse of both is there, but that's what you get with Zack Snyder's signature. And... Tr 
truly striking cinematography and lighting. Zack Snyder's taste, for lack of a better term, is metal. I mean, head-banging, distorted guitar solos, dramatic album cover art featuring flaming swords. Think of the metallic S symbol from Man of Steel. Think of the Wonder Woman theme, and then think of his cinematography as a visual accompaniment to heavy metal music. It's a high-octane, turn up the volume, and savoring the moment all out, all on assault on the senses. And lush cinematography, also been referred to as. Now, that brings us to the editing, handled by David Brenner, who also edited the theatrical cut, Batman v Superman 302, Man of Steel 2012, Wanted, The Day After Tomorrow, Identity, Independence Day, Born on the Fourth of July, right, and Carlos M. Castellón, who also helped. Oh, right, yeah, he's assistant editor and apprentice editor. Let's see. Spider-Man Far From Home, Aquaman, Justice, the yeah, theatrical cut, Batman v Superman 302, Man of Steel, Cowboys and Aliens, Iron Man 2, Iron Man, Flight Plan, Gigli, and Showtime. Yeah, it, Gigli is not his fault. And Dodie Dorn, who edited Fury, Sabotage, End of Watch, Kingdom of Heaven, Insomnia, Memento, and the director's cut of Terminator 2. And apparently there's only four minutes, four new minutes of footage shot for this. The rest of it are made up of deleted scenes. And I, I expected this cut, like nearly every Snyder movie ever, to have action that goes on for too long, especially in the last hour. Like, he's, in, in his more recent movies, he likes to make, yeah, yeah, again, I, since I'm spoiling, you know, Man of, Man of Steel and Batman v Superman, like, the last hour of the movie is just nonstop action. And here, that's not really the case. Now, I don't know if he's gotten better or if it's just that they didn't film that much more action than the theatrical cut by the time Jaws came in, since this cut is mostly made up of deleted scenes. And before you say, of course they didn't... No, 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 there are bits of action in this that were not in the theatrical cut. And, yeah, quoting some fellow critics... This version of Justice League is basically an unfinished movie with heavy need of editing. This isn't even a movie by norm any normal standards. It's an endlessly tedious, samey as baloney, written uh, all the way through tone toneless, color corrected, cliche written, unwritten, four hour PS5 cutscene populated by non characters mouthing exposition as they trudge through a series of so, so worn out tropes, from magic tubes to dark lords to parents dead in car crashes to daddy complexes. This is the antimatter of cinema. This is four hours of staring at a blank screen. It is boring and meaningless beyond comprehension. Everything in it is as generic and mass-produced as a Papa John's cheesy breadstick. Now, that's a little bit harsher than I would personally go, but yeah, there's definitely some some points made there holy crap almost two hours okay so the the special effects and visual effects there there's some really great stuff there and i do really appreciate you know it's it's one thing that um steppenwolf is a lot more visually like he, it's more convincing special effect I really appreciate that they gave him very human eyes so we can really understand him. Again, he's a monster, but we, like, yeah, I, I think that was the right choice, giving him very human eyes that emote really well and makes him a more interesting character. And, right, also, there's definitely more depth to his character than there was in the theatrical gut. And... I wouldn't necessarily say he's the most interesting character, but yeah, there's definitely more depth there. Now, the so the action has chases on foot and in vehicles, physical fights, 
shooting, including shooting while in vehicles, use of superpowers and superpowered items, equipment, and vehicles. And let's see. So the Right, the, the score, which was handled by Junkie XL, who also did music for Terminator Dark Fate, Alita Battle Angel, Batman v Superman, Deadpool, The Amazing Spider-Man 2, 302, and DOA. Now, some of it is just like with 300, like hard rock. I think it worked for that movie. I don't think it works that well for this one because of how complex this is and how simple and straightforward that one is. It can be very dark, heavy, where the theatrical cut used some of the music from the classic Batman Superman movies to reference those movies. This one does not. Even when the music expresses excitement, when it's communicating there's something cool, it's still very dreary. I agree with those who said that the score for the theatrical cut doesn't completely work for the movie, but I do think that the theatrical cut score is made by and for people who like fun and want to enjoy superheroes. And the score of this feels like it was composed by and for people who don't enjoy anything at all and who just want to be miserable all the time. Which, once again, that's perfectly fine. I just don't think it's right for the Justice League. And for th for four hours, it gets really it's just... Yeah. You know, there, there are tons of movies that should have that kind of score. There's this bit, like, a wailing woman that plays every time Wonder Woman does anything. It's absolutely ridiculous and some of the music and music placement is really silly and yeah one critic said the music sounds like Mad Max music and yeah and and again like those movies are you know it, it works for those but not oh, is the focus oh crap Okay, there it is. Right. Yeah. This program has good autofocus. I used to have problems with the autofocus freaking out before I started with this program. So, the. Let's see. Right, the, the tone. Now that Zack Snyder is in complete control, we don't have the uneven tone of the original theatrical cut, which would go back and forth between Zack's tone and Joss Whedon's, Joss Whedon's tone. This movie does not have the have tone issues at the hands of Joss Whedon. It does have a few bits where the tone is uneven, but it's entirely on Zack Snyder now, and there is less of it. So... The... the yeah, without end credits, the movie is three hours and 53 and a half minutes long, and four hours and two and a half minutes long with end credits, so, you know, around nine minutes of, of end credits. I wouldn't say that it's worth the investment of time, no. Honestly, I don't I don't see why why not just make a two and a half hour cut that's this with the Snyder visuals and then release another version that's like the ultimate edition or something. I I don't see why it was necessary to well, it wasn't necessary. I don't Yeah. So um, okay. The best element of this. I mean, it definitely is Snyder's vision of the, you know, of, yeah, for the first Justice League movie. It is what he wanted the, the this kind of, you know, yeah. And if you're a huge fan of his, you know, maybe it'll be worth it to you to watch it at least once. And maybe even to own it so you can rewatch over and over. You know, yeah, either buy a copy or, or get, what's it called, HBO Max. 
Now, the worst element about this is that it is Zack Snyder's vision. I'm kidding. The worst aspect is definitely the length and the bloat. Again, the length by itself wouldn't be a problem if not for the bloat. And let's see the... And let's see, the worst aspect, according to others, is all the exposition. And so, let's see, the thing I was most worried about would be that it wouldn't really be that different, and that the things that were different wouldn't be better, or at least not very much better than the theatrical cut, and largely the movie lived down to my expectations. I was most looking forward to the... Yeah, you're probably not going to believe me at this point, but I was really hoping for some really compelling Snyder... Like, I never want to not enjoy a Snyder movie. You know, like, I wouldn't keep watching his movies if I thought that they were... Like, for, for a long time, I, yeah, I, I had really high hopes for him. After Dawn of the Dead and 300, I thought that this was going to, like, he was going to deliver some of the very best, you know. His Watchmen movie, like, I always realized that it had issues, but I did, there, there are a lot of things about it that, you know, yeah. Anyway, yeah, I guess, actually, no, yeah, when I watched Sucker Punch, as ridiculous as I thought it was, it didn't make me lose faith in him, and there are things about Man of Steel that work, but Batman v Superman and this, like, just, just go and, and, you know, direct something more along the lines of 300, find a new 300, and you know, dive deep into that, and I really think it's going to be, you know, there's, there's, yeah. I'm, I'm not saying that he's made no positive contributions to the DCU. He apparently, you know, he cast Gal Gadot, which, I mean, okay, so her acting, but she has the look and the, the sort of passion and attitude, you know, so, yeah. Now, but, but, yeah, and, and, right, there are things in this that I really love that are very Zack Snyder. Like I mentioned, like, the narration and monologuing, some of that is absolutely great. And the, yeah, so the trailers give away too much. But they do also give you a good idea of if you'll like the movie. You know, if you like the trailer, you're more likely to like the movie than if you do not. The cover and poster do not give too much away. And they do give you a good idea of what the movie is like. Although, at least one of the covers shows dark side. Like, it, it makes it look... Oh, hold on. No, never mind. Yeah. Spoiler. There's a there's at least one spoiler on at least one of the the covers, but yeah, the it makes it look like Darkseid will have a lot of screen time, which he really doesn't. And I have a suggestion for how to fix at least one really major issue dealing with characters. I will get into it at the end of notes of the notes taken while. Wait, did I or did I move it? I yeah, what one of the one of the notes taken sections? Uh, yeah, and yeah, the there are some there are some plot holes that really bug me that I you know I I can't go into detail about them without spoiling the movie, so they'll be in one of the spoiler sections. So. When I looked it up, this had a 71% on the Rotten Tomatoes. 
based on 302 reviews and a 94% audience score based on over 200 over 25,000 ratings of the 302 215 rated it fresh and the average rating for audience scores were 4.7 out of 5 and did I really not? Wow. I guess I... Did I forget to put in meta? I'm... I have my, my smartphone right here. I'm gonna real quick look up the movie on Metacritic so that I can briefly mention that as well. There we go. Yeah, on Metacritic, it has 54. That makes sense to me, yeah. Based on 46 reviews, right, 54 out of 100 for those who might not know how the Metacritic scoring goes, and user score of 8.7 out of 10. So, yeah, audiences really loved it. But let's be honest, there's probably a lot of Snyder fans voting. And on IMDb, it has a score of 8.1 out of 10. And it's based on 7th... Oh, right, yeah. And there are 7,843 IMDb reviews, user reviews, and the external reviews section has 293 links and 186 of them were in languages I speak. I don't think there were any dead links, not for something this recent. Right, 342,724 IMDb users voted and yeah, 39.7 gave it a 10 19.2, a 9, 18.3, an 8, 10.6, a 7, and then it's small numbers for the rest. So the... I have to admit, I was expecting a lot more gore and violence in this. I really admire Snyder's restraint here. I... I don't think this movie needs a lot of violence, and he didn't put a lot of violence. Thinking about it again, I don't know, I mean, if they weren't going to make it R-rated from the start, and he, let's see, he got 40 million for all the post-production work, I guess it's possible that he would have made it more violent with a bigger budget. I, I can't say for sure. Yeah, but yeah, you know, violence, sex, and swearing, there's not very much of that. I'm not saying there's anything fundamentally wrong with violence, sex, and swearing in movies. You know, in, in real life, there's nothing wrong with sex, as long as consent is respected. And I did think there's a lot of situations where swearing is perfectly fine. Violence is almost never the answer. But the, and yes, I realize that as a big fan of action movies, that sounds... I only want violence in fiction, is what I'm saying. But yeah, the I'm, I'm saying those three things would not have made the movie better. Like, it, you know, I, I'm not gonna... I, th I think someone like Quentin Tarantino uses swearing really well. He's, he's good at writing funny dialogue that uses a lot of swearing. So I wouldn't want for... You know, when I, when I watch a, a Tarantino movie, I don't leave it saying, wow. I mean, that was that was kind of a lot of swearing, you know. It's it works really well for him, but and and I do think Snyder sometimes uses it well, but I really don't think it would have made this movie any better. Now, let's see the holy crap. Two hours and ten minutes. 
but I'm almost completely done with the review. I do have a lot of thoughts. Wow, I copied in a lot. Okay, I'm not going to read all of this. Okay, here we go. Yeah, I recommend this to fans of Zack Snyder, fans of the Snyderverse. The, the Blu-ray, there's, you know, there's one behind-the-scenes extra. It's 22 minutes. It's basically a making of... Did I just say that twice? I'm gonna... Hold on. I would not buy the Blu-ray for the the this extra. Buy the Blu-ray if you don't want HBO Max, but you do want access to the movie. You know, it's it's a fine enough extra, if, if special feature, but it's nothing special. And also the if you buy the regular Blu-ray, I I don't know if it if the is it called Justice is Grey? I think it's called Justice is Grey. Whatever. That uh, if if you're if you're buying this online, and it doesn't say Justice is Grey edition included, then it probably doesn't have it. I I wasn't looking for that. I wasn't surprised that it wasn't featured on there. I think that might be purely for HBO Max. I think there's a number of people who w who are willing to buy this, but who would not buy, would not pay extra for Justice is Grey. Anyway. So, I guess, ultimately, it comes down to five slow-motion sausages flying through the air out of ten. And, honestly, this movie, just for the technical aspects alone, I wanted to give it 8 out of 10, but it's just way too long, way too slow. I've said a lot of negative things about this movie in this video. I do want to make clear, I am glad that I watched it, but honestly, that's mostly because I appreciate now how much of an uphill battle it was for Joss Whedon to try to salvage this movie in the theatrical cut, and how good of a job he did considering his odds. It's still not a good movie, but that's largely not his fault, I realize now. And that brings us to the thoughts sections. So, starting with disclaimers. If you don't care about these disclaimers, I'll try to keep them short and relevant, but your mileage may vary. You can skip right ahead to the section of your choice via the description box. I often try to talk very fast during the disclaimers, since a lot of it's very standard information. I'm not going to keep speaking as fast as I sometimes do during the section, once again, to the rest of the video itself. With that said, please do note that some of the specific discussion of the movie may be in this section. So, from here on out, spoilers for this movie and earlier entries in the DCU. So... Am I glad that this is a sequel? I mean, at the end of the day, when you really... So much of the... Like, for so much of Batman v Superman, Batman is ridiculously paranoid and hates Superman. And then in this one, like, he just... He trusts that Superman will do the right thing and has faith. And it just... I mean, it didn't really feel like that movie built to this one, other than the this thing of, you know, okay, now Steppenwolf is back. Well, no, yeah, I mean, there's a little bit of hints. Again, I'm, not, I'm only talking theatrical cuts. This is the only one where we're not talking about the theatrical cut here. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to bring in Batman v Superman Ultimate Edition stuff. But yeah, there's, there's really barely any hint towards this in, in the... Yeah, the yeah the the mother box, the mother box creating cyborg. That was the one thing in Batman v Superman that really points to to this. And and then there's the hint of the the there's a hint of of a move. Yeah, there's a hint of a future where Superman is evil working for Darkseid, but we don't really get that 
here. So, yeah. No, it, it's... I mean, in some ways the movie makes more sense if you haven't watched Batman v Superman. Or at least pretend that that stuff didn't happen. It just, like... I... How can Zack Snyder possibly believe... Like, the, the idea that the, per the, the Batman we meet in Batman v Superman is actually going to create a team and lead a team and he's going to trust Superman. It just, it feels completely ridiculous. You know, when the, the he needs to work with stuff like, like in Watchmen, there's also characters that behave in this really destructive way but because there are enough other characters, we can still have a team without the characters that are really destructive and dangerous leading that team. Or at least not leading the team for very long. Do I hope this movie will get sequels? I mean... If just... If Snyder... You know what? If Snyder actually does get to make the movie where Superman is evil and Flash is traveling back through time to warn Batman so that he can prevent Superman from becoming evil. If Snyder finally gets to make that movie, maybe he'll stop constantly referencing how he really badly wants to make that movie. I think I think it could turn out well. Clearly he the the way he wants to treat superhuman beings in his movies is that he wants for them to be evil or not good but we should just be we should just consider ourselves lucky that they're not running around killing us all basically so m maybe that would would finally be the the yeah now the rest of this video is not a review. It, it is a series of well thoughts, some is analysis, some is MC theory, riff tracks, and other jokes. And the section right after this is thoughts that I have while watching in chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting, and the like. And I think I will also include the section thoughts that I had before watching. For a while, I wasn't going to, but. Gradually, I wrote more and more before watching, so, yeah. Does the movie appear to have empathy for the least likable characters? I mean... It does see, it does have empathy for Steppenwolf, but then I guess the, the least likable character is probably Darkseid, maybe Desaad. And it doesn't really, I mean, we know almost nothing about, I'm, I'm not talking about, like, you know, obviously you know stuff from the, we know stuff from the comics, but, like, Snyder's changing things all over the place, so we can't really rely on that. That's not good enough. And no, we, we know almost nothing about Dark Side, which I, I really don't, th I think this movie should have just, I mean, it couldn't have been someone completely different, but I think... The theatrical cut that just omits Dark Side completely. I th I think that worked better. I I don't understand why people are excited that Dark Side stands around for the entire movie doing absolutely nothing. Like once he knows where it's mother boxes. It's, we're not we're not talking about like Steppenwolf is like oh you know I think I have and Darkseid's like you know whatever call me when you have proof no Darkseid they know where the mother boxes are and Darkseid just isn't sending more troops and isn't sending other like lieutenants and then at the end of the movie he's like oh I guess I'm, okay I'll I will I will go ahead and remove my finger from my ass and then we will eventually at some point in the future we will invade earth it's like you almost made it like literally if they had sent just a little bit more like of uh let's say they sent a hundred more 
parademons. Let's say Desaad or Darkseid showed up. That's it. The good guys lose. You know, it, and just, yeah. Okay, so this movie is in a genre where it's very important not overexpose the threat, the creature, for example. I will say, if you don't need there to be any depth to Darkseid, if you don't care that you don't know who he is other than going off the comics, I, you know, the movie doesn't show him so much that we get used to him. So there's that, at least. And he does look imposing. Am I making jokes on this? Should not necessarily be taking as me thinking the thing I'm joking about is actually bad or me wanting to make light of the subject. I simply find it very difficult not to MST3K everything I watch. Okay, a lot of the jokes are based on me thinking that it's bad, but moving on. So, that brings us to the next section. Notes taken while watching. I forget if this was in the theatrical cut or the ultimate edition of Batman v Superman, but, you know, Lex Luthor goes, Ding Dong, the God is Dead, which I can't help but add on. Which old God? The Pouty God. Ding Dong, the crappy God is Dead. And the trailer, Steppenwolf says, so begins the end, which, again, I can't help but add. And so ends the beginning, and so the middle is middling. Okay, so... Notes I took during watching in chronological order. So the opening is fairly gratuitous. We see Superman stabbed by Doomsday, but now that Zack Snyder can work with an R rating, there's some more gore and violence. We see the stab wound more clearly. You know, when people were already talking about how self-indulgent your recent movies have been, Zack, maybe don't open your four-hour movie by reminding people of how redundant the opening of... Yeah, of of your least popular recent movie with, yeah, with the terrible, terribleness, ter ter yeah, with how terrible Batman v Superman is. And we see Superman's yell oscillating, which starts off the mother boxes in America, the mascara, which is why the events uh, happen after Batman v Superman, not during or before. The yell signals the mother boxes to become active. You know, I've heard of heavy sleepers, but this might be the first time I've heard of someone needing the alarm clock to be a superhumanly loud, oscillating scream. If this hasn't already been memed, someone seriously need to put someone hitting the snooze button right after the mother box is awake. And... I, I don't know why... Steppenwolf doesn't arrive right away. Like in the theatrical cut, like the the what's it called? The the ah let me think. The the in the theatrical cut, the the what's it called? The 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 mother box on Themyscira, the, the, you know, it start, here it starts to crack right after Superman died. And then, I mean, I guess it's supposed to be like a few weeks later or something. Then Steppenwolf comes in. In the theatrical cut, between the crack and Steppenwolf arriving, if I recall, I watched it like two weeks ago by now, I guess. A week, a week, ago, a week and a half ago by now. And it was basically like the, if, if I recall, it was right away. Like they've basically been looking for the mother boxes for a long time. And the moment that there was a crack in one, which happened because too many people were despairing about Superman. So the, the mother box signaled, this is the time to attack. I mean, what, what were they waiting for? What, why didn't Steppenwolf show up right away? And again, like Joss Whedon, fixed this he he did like it just it makes so much more sense for it to to go directly from the the crack to yeah anyway we see Lex Luthor in the goop in the ship and he sees a very shiny Steppenwolf which I understand is in 
the Ultimate Edition of Batman v Superman. We see Mira and other Atlanteans hearing the oscillating scream. I want to say, was it Black Nerd Comedy who said, you know, in, in Atlantis, Amber heard the scream? That was, that was pretty funny. That was a good joke. Maybe somebody already did this, but if not, this really needs to be turned into a meme where the screaming starts because some guy stubbed his toe or something. And... Let's see, after the various mother boxes, we end on the one on Themyscira, and they really let their grow some tension this time instead of rushing through it like in the theatrical cut. I don't know exactly what that Amazonian was going to do with the mother box, but... When it partially came open, clearly that's bad news. And we cut to Bruce tracking down Aquaman. Not gonna lie, I did not see this structural edit coming. And it was at this point that I was like, how long did we skip ahead in time? Did nothing happen with the mother box on the mascara? With the crack in it all that time? The oscillating yell start, started when Superman died. And, I mean, clearly Bruce has been traveling for at least a, a little while to get to this Finnish village. Bruce refuses to leave without talking to Aquaman. So Aquaman picks him up, slams him into the wall. We got almost 12 minutes into a Zack Snyder movie before two men started having a dick measuring contest. His restraint stuns me to my core. Dressed like a bat. You already mind, Bruce Wayne. Why would you leave that line in when you cut the setup to it? I was going to make a joke about how the Icelandic women, you know, yes, yeah, singing worship J Jason Momoa because he's a confident man in the Zack Snyder movie. And then I saw one of them sniff the shirt he left behind. I was joking. I, I think it was Pitch Meeting who said, that shirt probably smells like fish. Yeah, yeah. Sm almost definitely smells like fish, yeah. And the cop that Amy Adam, that Lois Lane hands coffee to is named Jerry. Is that a reference to Superman co-creator Jerry Siegel? R.I.P. Very cool. And we see the terrorists attack the museum where Wonder Woman stops them, but not until they've gunned down a lot of people, even more than in the theatrical cut. And... It takes a really long time for, like, we see him walk all the way up the stairs and through, and just, and it doesn't add anything. And it's especially, like, didn't he make the movie partially for people who were disappointed with the theatrical cut? Like, we know what's going to happen in this scene. He didn't change anything there, you know. The, the outcome of the scene is the same. It does look like they've completely removed the bit from the theatrical cut where Batman stops a burglar, fights one of the aliens. I always figured that was a Joss Whedon scene anyway, so not surprised it's gone. And I don't think it's a huge loss. No offense, Joss. And the Wonder Woman action scene plays out slightly differently. Stuff like speed ramping is different. There's more blood and violence. I thought the theatrical cut was plenty in bad taste, but the Snyder Cut really drags out the scene where we're worried that this terrorist is going to gun down schoolchildren, schoolgirls, in bloody, gory, R-rated detail, gory civilian death, a la his Dawn of the Dead, or, you know, in 300 with the tree of dead people. And one woman shows some compassion and empathy towards the civilians she just saved. Now, obviously, there is a huge difference between the people she fights in Wonder Woman 1984 and this movie. And Wonder Woman 1984 is a terrible movie. I'm, and I say that as a huge fan of the first movie and Patty Jenkins in general. I don't really blame her for that movie, but I'm not making excuses for that movie either. Anyway, I can't help but notice that in Wonder Woman 1984, she went out of her way to not badly injure those she fought. And straight up protected physically the people in the White House that were... Hmm. Let me see. Yes, yes. The the Wonder Woman 1984 was released before the Snyder Cut. I'm almost 100%. Yeah, I'm just really quickly going to 
gonna look up so the let's see uh, I guess the best place to look would be the IMDB app so I'm just really quickly I'm almost certain but I'm just gonna make 100% sure so Okay, so this movie was released, what does it say? Hmm. It should say somewhere around here. Okay, March, yeah, March 18, 2021. So... Looking up Wonder Woman 1984. Yeah, Wonder Woman 1984 was 2020. So, yeah, I am spoiling that movie. Yeah, so in yeah, in the White House, she protected the people that were being attacked by Cheetah. This movie and right. Yeah, this movie and this scene, she went out of her way to kill the terrorists. If this scene had been written and directed by Patty Jenkins, Diana would have been extremely careful to protect the innocence of these now definitely traumatized schoolgirls. In a way, it's almost worse that she just turned around and smiles and sweetly encourages the little girl. She could be whatever she wants to be. How detached from your emotions do you have to be that you can kill so brutally and then literally turn around? and immediately be swi smiling sweetly and empathizing. If Patty Jenkins had handled the scene, Diana would have found some way to ensure that these children did not see the brutality that the terrorists faced. She would have been separating them into different rooms. Again, for sure, the terrorists are monsters and needed stopping, and if it couldn't have been done without killing them, then that's what needs to be done. Also, I've heard some defend the upskirt shot, and she's interrogating the guy. Of course, it's going to be filmed from below to make her look more powerful. So far, so good. Agreed. But they couldn't, like, let's see. I mean, I would, let's see, the, the, yeah, just, if you frame it slightly differently, you, you know, I, I really don't think that it would, you know, there there are definitely ways to avoid it. The, let's see, I think, yeah, I'm going to just move on. Anyway, the, Yeah, so I've I've heard some say the men in this are sexualized too. Why does it only matter when women are sexualized? Historically, women have been treated like objects, not always sex objects, but that's one that that is the one we're dealing with here. The more women are turned into sex objects in movies, the more it makes it difficult for women to be taken seriously in the real world. This is a problem that men face to a much lesser extent. Considering that it looks like the fact that Superman yells and his yells oscillate will be a big deal, I guess this movie would have been very different if Doomsday had taken Thanos' device. You should have gone for the head. Am I mixing up my franchises? That was a joke. And let's see. Here we go. Sorry, did that did that sound like vaguely like Annoyed that was yeah. Evil does not sleep. It waits. Epic. And let's see. I I do really enjoy, you know, when yeah, he, he shows up and he's like I have come to bathe in your fear. Daughters of Themyscira, show him your fear. We have no fear. Very 300. 
you know, really remind me of Spartans. What is your profession? You know, we already knew that one of Zack's favorite things is half-naked fighters wielding such old weaponry, fighting against an invader who hates freedom. Good tension and suspense when they are sealing the gates and Queen Hippolyta is being slowed down by one of the I don't know, it's a pair of demons is what they're called. And I like the weight it's given when the entire building collapses into the sea and yet the aliens fly out. You know, I've I've heard some say, you know, oh, but they can teleport anyway. I mean yeah, ba basically th this entire bit you know, the, there's not really anything. What are they going to do to to stop? Yeah. I really like seeing the Amazons trying to stop Steppenwolf with rope arrows, which is a major part of their tactics. The entire scene on Themyscira still is a really epic game of keep away. The great darkness begins. Oh no, that monster changed the Wi-Fi password. He's gone back to his own dimension. No, he's gone to the world of men for the other two boxes. Come on, obviously the lieutenant knew that. This is purely for the audience's benefit. Go, follow the scent of the mother boxes, and when you reach them, tell them to take a shower seriously. Maybe these barbarians don't use a gate. Oh yeah? Well, then how do they board their planes, smart guy? I like the weight given to the alien abduction, to the box being with Victor. Love Diana investigating exactly what the arrow means. Arthur Vines and Wines at Volko. You still owe me, you still owe the Great One 50,000 more worlds. Holy crap, I guess Darkseid decided I won't be your friend anymore. And some pretty cool stuff within the flashback battle scene. Darkseid is cool looking. Multiple battle cries. And I'm not the first person to say, you know, Darkseid getting defeated is way too, way too easily. Or, yeah, he gets defeated way too easily. They deal with the mother boxes best they can. Reduced speed area on a sign leading into Central City right before the intro to Bury the Flash. I mean, it's kind of a dad joke, but it's okay. Barry is way too extra for the, the woman who may or may not hire him to walk dogs. I mean, I guess the scene doubles as a warning for drivers to watch where they're going, since that is really the problem here. Both the truck driver and Iris West were not watching where they're going. And I appreciate that Barry's love interest isn't white. The the music chosen for the you know him saving her. Is, is just absolutely ridiculous. It, it might actually be the most ridiculous needle drop in any Zack Snyder movie ever, and that is saying something. And it's kind of, like, it's kind of creepy how he's, like, touching her hair and, like, spending several seconds just staring right at her and just, yeah. And the tiptoeing out of, of the place that, to get there did look kind of goofy. And, like, if he's moving so fast that his shoes are, are breaking, why, like, why can he run so fast in the, in the what's it called, the, the street thing that the street, like, gets shattered without it hurting his feet, like, I could understand if he was wearing the suit that, you know, the flash suit that he wears later, but he's not. And it really shouldn't have, like, the, the dog walker boss should easily have been able to tell that he 
you know, he he was he was still outside when things were moving in in norm at normal speed. So the you know, it's not like he moved so fast that he just wouldn't be visible at all. And you know, but yeah, he to to cover he jumps into that little pit and he feeds the hot dog to one or more of the regular temperature dogs, hoping that to her it just looks like he jumped in there. Like he claimed to. I will never betray my people, especially not to such dodgy CGI. And we get Victor's background flashback, which is good. He did it because he has a good heart. But then when the accident happens, he's like, fuck the world. So I guess the idea is that it's showing how much he changed. I can't wait to see what you do tomorrow. You think he might be a legend of tomorrow? It would be pretty funny if he actually put accidentally put down the wrong recorder and it's actually like a motivational tape, like how to be more confident if you're a scientist or something. It's entire nuclear arsenal you could launch with a thought. But apparently not the thought fuck the world. That would not do it. I don't know why. It seems like it would, but it won't. Yeah, not gonna lie, this is pretty disaster porny, and you know, that part of the description of what Victor can do, like Zack would love to have the nukes be fired. It is nice that Victor helps that woman. I've seen some people point out that if this were the real world, the IRS would destroy her for this, and thus it would no longer be the act of a good person helping some, you know, it would no longer be something that helped her. At first, I felt like that was being overly critical. There's, you know, there, there's a lot of heroic acts in these movies and stories in general that in the real world wouldn't do as much good as they first appeared to, but then Cyborg could do so much more. He could hack and change laws that so that people like this poor woman would have a much easier time getting by. And Victor said, Vic, uh, Silas says that He's only been talking to Victor as a scientist, not a f now he's going to relate to him as a father, and Victor crushes the recorder, doesn't want to hear it. A decent bit of pen tension with a parademon almost going through the window as Victor stands with the mother box. And some improvements in the scene of Barry talking to his father. Naturally, I really thought that the meeting between Bruce and Barry would be different. I mean, these jokes still feel like Joss Whedon jokes. Does this mean that Zack Snyder didn't think... Yeah, I, I, it baffles me that he wouldn't trim at least some of these jokes out. He even added music to highlight a couple of the punchlines. And the music underlines the pretty lame punchline, what are your superpowers, I'm rich. Alfred micromanages Wonder Woman making tea. Zack is just screwing with us at this point. This does not need to be in the movie. I appreciate that Wonder Woman points out to Alfred that Batman using the gauntlet to capture and release energy is just like her gauntlets. Diana opening up to Cyborg is a decent enough scene. I'll talk to him tonight. How, Jim? How do you think? So that might be the stupidest thing I've heard in an extremely long time. What do you mean, how? 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 It's the bat signal. It's practically a beeper. Page or whatever. And Steppenwolf strangles Mira because it's not an R-rated Zack Snyder movie if there isn't some gratuitous violence against women. And she uses her power affecting fluids in Steppenwolf's blood. That is kind of cool. You know, some people have you know called it blood bending. Yeah. Go interrogate the prisoners. Pretty sure it could have arrived at that conclusion on its own. This has very strong 
meetings that could have been an email energy. Cyborg saves his father and yeah, and, and to grab the mind reading spider, he forms a third arm out of convenience, just like a robot with some ability to change his shape in that other franchise where Joe Morton built killer robots. And Steppenwolf looks at his axe and tries to grab it, but Wonder Woman charges at him before he can attack her. Getting kind of a Wild West quick draw feel. Not bad. I like that Steppenwolf is impressed by Wonder Woman being strong, but I do miss the line. Okay, I'm going to try to do the, the voice. You have the blood of the old gods in you. The old gods died. Especially considering he does deliver the first part of the line. Wait, was that another? Like, does Joss Whedon write the old gods died? That's one of the best... It's one of the best bad guy lines in the entire movie, in the theatrical cut. Wow. The story of the Defiance is well known. Who are you saying this for? The audience? Because Wonder Woman already told them. Okay, so those parademons are either being really respectful of Darkseid, or they all simultaneously drop their contacts. I have turned a hundred thousand worlds to dust. This guy is single-handedly saving the dustbuster industry. What, you talk to that thing? I speak to intelligence. And sometimes I talk to Atlanteans. Oh, they love heat. I mean, it's peak Michael Mann, who doesn't? And Cyborg gives the team a history lesson. And he puts himself there, but at this point, when he envisions himself, he still looks like the person he used to be, where later, when the boxes tempt him, he accepts that he is no longer that person, but he isn't broken either. Who's going to say it? I'm not going to say it. Cyborg is a good choice of who to say it. He can do, more visually dram he can do it more visually dramatically than the others. I lost the farm. Well, your husband adopted some, bought the farm. Mr. Perry told me you haven't been to work since Clark died. You know you work in America, right? You are so fired. But they didn't know Clark. Well, neither did you, Martian Manhunter, and most barely. I mean, it is incredibly messed up that Martian Manhunter does this. This is emotional manipulation, even if he means well. This is still deeply wrong to do. I don't know why he didn't just approach Lois as General Swanwick and say that he misses Superman too, since Swanwick put his life in Superman's hands in both Man of Steel and BVS. Barry behaves extremely suspiciously. There is no way he would be let into Star Labs. Why doesn't Victor contact, his, contact Silas and ask him to help get them into Star Labs? Is it because people without powers or Batman level skills aren't allowed to be useful in Snyder films that have superpower beings? I'm in. In a 90s hacker movie, apparently. The Nightmare Vision is pretty cool, and I guess it was the only way we, we get to see very much of Darkseid kicking ass in this, since he's pretty easy to take out during the actual battle that Diana flashes back to. I don't have a lot to say about the fight between Superman and the Justice League. You know, depending on who you ask, either Diana isn't using the last of ability show truth when she uses it on Superman, which proves that it was stupid of Wonder Woman 1984 to write it into the canon, or she tries and it just fails. I mean, both of them are kind of silly, convenient writing. I realize that the theatrical cut came out before Wonder Woman 1984, but this came out after. It would be very easy to edit that part of the fight out. Superman, you're being a lot more murdery than you were before dying and being resurrected. Here, they have a Snickers. You're not you when you're hungry. Better? 
you know, when I saw Cyborg saving the car from, saving the guy from the flying car in the trailers, I kind of assumed it was one of the bad guys who made it go flying into the air, not Superman. But then I guess Snyder Superman is one of the bad guys. Also, the guy who, the actor who plays the cop played Jimmy Olsen in the old movies. I was about to note that in this, I guess, Snyder didn't want to have some fun with that character, considering he had him shot in the face in Batman v Superman, but then he almost has him crushed under a car in this. In the theatrical cut, Lois' grief isn't focused on all that much, but in this movie it is, which makes it especially disgusting that after all her grief, she gets the person she lost ba back. When grief is in fiction, it should not lead to you getting back the person that you lost. That's not how it works in the real world. Grief in media should help us with grief in real life. It should not slow down the grieving process by giving unrealistic expectations. Instead, it should focus on how to cope with the lost, how, how to grieve help in a healthy way. When Superman is revived... Why doesn't Batman have some kryptonite? What happened to the spear, for example? Even if he doesn't have any, like, kryptonite gas grenades left. It's just, like, why wouldn't he at least have it just in case? Oh no, Steppenwolf is about to grab the mother box from the lab. Phew, good thing Cyborg got in there just in time so he could stand and watch while Steppenwolf takes it. I realize that obviously he got emotional because his father was dying right in front of him, but if absolutely nothing else, why didn't the auto defense system sense danger? Was it because that was just there because they needed at least a little bit of an excuse for Superman to attack the Justice League? Why did Silas commit suicide when overheating it? Why didn't just superheating it? Why didn't he just stand somewhere else? Is it because Snyder is obsessed with the idea of heroic sacrifice? Lois and Clark go back to the farm. No one will be seated during this. Lois Lane retrieves a shirt scene. I don't hate that when the boxes unite and synchronize, it is hurt by the Amazonians and in Atlantis. So, as far as I can tell, the from from when the let's see, when Batman gets into the dome. And the and until Steppenwolf is dead, there's actually only about fifteen minutes, so that's a lot less than I thought, considering the other Snyder, yeah. But then I guess it does. There's not a huge space between that and the Superman fight, and before that, there was the fight under the harbor yeah anyway let's see i do appreciate seeing cyborg do more different things with cyborg powers in this than in the theatrical it is legitimately tense when Steppenwolf is about to attack Cyborg and the others trying to keep him away. Uh, the Dark Side and the others were literally turned away from where the portal opens for no other reason than to do a dramatic turn towards the camera. And when present day Victor talks to the three projections that the mother boxes make, they do a really great job on the creepy eyes, like, you know, Stepford Wives kind of thing. You know, you can tell that there's something wrong here. Dark Side steps on Steppenwolf's head, and I just kind of wish they'd gone full Halloween 2018 with it. The epilogue starts with 27 minutes left. Before, yeah, yeah. With three hours and 35 minutes in, and yeah. So let's see. The entire epilogue. Uh, let's see, what was that, 15 minutes? Eh, okay. It, it felt a lot longer. But yeah. And Cyborg reconstructs the recording thing, because why not? I 100% understand why Joss Whedon cut Henry Allen embarrassing his son by being super proud. 
this guy's still in prison. I doubt that he would get that excited about his son getting the worst job you can get in a crime lab. Like, this is the kind of excitement that, like, if he said, I have concrete evidence that you didn't kill mom, you know, that I could, but, yeah. I'm pretty sure I'm not the first person to point out that Lex Luthor's escape seems like way more of a trick that the Joker would pull, and in fact did in at least one well-known story. Lex Luthor asked why he agrees to kill Batman for free, and Wilson said, and realized, it's personal. Dude, you're just upset because you beat up in high school. By Peter Parker, I understand that must suck. So, let's see, the ending nightmare... It's about five minutes. You have no idea how I feel. So in all the time they've been doing this, not once did she ever realize that Bruce lost his parents. Considering that he loses his shit if someone says his mother's name, I kind of doubt that. But of course it's... a. Uh, it's, it's there as a setup for the Joker's monologue because Snyder couldn't think of a good way to transition into that. All you have to do is rip uh, this card in half. Focus puller, focus puller. The Joker's out of focus. Holy crap, even the movie's falling asleep now, joining the audience. Can I help you? Holy crap. Bruce went, you know, it, when, when Bruce first met an alien in, in Batman v Superman, he spent an absurd amount of time and resources trying to make sure that he killed them. And now he's just like, so, hello. And that brings us... The final section. Notes taken while watching. Before watching, right? At the very end with Martian Manhunter, you get the sense that. Bruce doesn't really want to talk to him. He's just trying to get rid of him, humor him. And yeah, so for the following, I'm going to have to spoil Infinity War, which uh, is a movie you should have watched. If you watch this movie, you should definitely have watched Infinity War. Once again, yes, the original theatrical cut of Justice League did hit theaters before Infinity War did. In fact, it's entirely possible that the writers looked at Justice League and adjusted some things in Infinity War from the mistakes made in the theatrical cut of Justice League, the same way they got the idea to do Civil War, at least do it sooner than otherwise, when they heard that the DCU was going to do Batman v Superman. They wanted a versus movie of their own, Civil War is infinitely better than Batman v Superman. And I think it almost always reflects even more poorly on Justice League they got there first, so they should have had the better handling. That's very frequently the case when you have two movies that are very similar. The one that came out first was the most well handled, and the other one imitated it so much that it was like, what's the point in making that in making that movie when it's so similar to the original? Or they did a bad job showing that they didn't really understand why the other one worked, or didn't have a good enough idea of how to do something similar. Swapping fingers. I believe it was Filmento who pointed out. Okay, never mind. Who pointed out that in Infinity War, the character introductions, development, and growth follows the plot of the heroes trying to prevent Thanos from collecting all six Infinity Stones. When Tony and Doctor Strange first encounter each other, their egos lead to arguments, and Doctor Strange tells Tony he's willing to sacrifice both Peter and Tony if that is the only way to protect the Time Stone. But then later we see that he actually does the opposite. He sacrifices the Time Stone in order to save Tony's life. So that means. There has been growth without that getting in the way of the fight to keep the Infinity Stones away from Thanos. Where in this movie, despite Diana knowing a lot about the time last time Darkseid attempted to conquer Earth using the Mother Boxes, because her kind, the Amazonians, experienced it and wrote it down a bunch of stuff about it, 
which Diana read, and Aquaman having a connection to the Mother Box and the Lance because, well, it's buried in the Lance, and that's where his mother was from. And so the movie should tie the characters to the Mother Boxes. Diana is passionate about the Mother Box on Themyscira, the island of the Amazons. Maybe the arrow tells her about the invasion is fired not long after Superman dies, since that's when the crack appears in the box. So Diana sends communication back, since apparently she can't return to the island, so she's more connected to that mother box plot wise. Yeah, okay. No more spoilers for Infinity War for the time being. Now, I think it's possible that they didn't know for sure that it was Darkseid before Seven Wolf attacked and wrapped the mother box, but just rewrite that they guess it was Darkseid. At the very least, they sent the arrow to Diana that the Mother Box was awakening, and then that drives her to tell Bruce to start looking for the Mother Box that was buried by mankind. And they're connected. Now, Aquaman struggles with being accepted by his people, but he feels that only he can prevent them from getting the Mother Box. Steppenwolf from getting the Mother Box. So, once again, his characters died. So, the plot of the Mother Box. Maybe that's how he finally decides to become a hero again. At first, he was only going to prevent the Mother Box, since, you know, the conquering of Earth and all. But then he decides that he has to become a hero to the world, not only to humans, but to problems related to the sea. And... Okay, um, yeah, so I realized that the movie would still have issues due to having to introduce Aquaman, Cyborg, and Flash, since they haven't appeared in movies before this, other than, you know, the brief in Batman and Superman, but it still significantly improved the movie, and certainly if Infinity War can do so much like work in developing that's his character, then this movie should be able to do that with at least one major character. And, you know, certainly there's more depth to Thanos, but, to uh, Cyborg, there's more development to Cyborg. But it's not... Holy crap, I'm sleeping. Okay. Um... Yeah, so I'm just gonna move on. Um, I understand removing the Russian family being rescued bit from the movie. I'm definitely not surprised that that was Joss Whedon. This idea, yeah, Joss Whedon's idea rather than Zack Snyder's. I do think it is pretty silly to yet again have the final climactic battle being a totally abandoned. You guys, seriously, no one's around, so it doesn't matter how much collateral damage the fight causes including the stuff that the heroes, that are clearly the heroes' fault. I'm not saying we have to see heroes saving people in all these movies, but I don't think it would be a bad thing for Zack if Zack started to show it more frequently in his movies. Considering how little there is of it. I did like seeing Darkseid use the, using the Omega Beam vision to attack. Not gonna lie, that's something I wanted to see in a DC movie since, I don't know, 2001, I think. At the very end, when Superman comes in and prevents the bad guy from meeting Cyborg, of course he says, not impressed. When in Joss Whedon's version, he said, I believe in truth, but I'm also a big fan of justice. Because Joss considers Superman an icon who stands for something good. And to Zack Snyder, Superman is a cool, big, tough guy who punches people hard. He's a real badass. Come to think of it, why did they remove every single reference from the theatrical cut to Superman? Inspiring hope in people, even though Batman and Superman did imp imply or even state that. In the theatrical cut... Did I say why didn't they remove... I think I meant to, yeah, I meant to say, didn't they remove? You know, in Batman v Superman, they implied that Superman did inspired at least some hope, but then in this movie, in the Snyder Cut, I don't think there's a single reference to that. And in the theatrical cut, the opening 
shows that minorities are being treated badly, pushing unhoused individuals. You know, the I tried sign Bruce tells Diana she should be inspiring people like Superman. I definitely do get removing the latter scene, I guess. The former just wasn't what Zack Snyder was going for. But if Superman doesn't inspire hope in this movie, then the only reason to bring him back is because he's a big, cool, tough guy who punches people real hard, a real badass. I mean, the only thing his death actually caused that was bad is that the mother boxes realized that now he was dead and seeing <laughs> yes uh, you know before he came to earth there was a green lantern protecting earth who i guess just figured well there's a kryptonian there now no need i feel like it would have been a decent thing to do some exposition about since this is a very exposition heavy movie I understand why Zack Snyder is so eager to tell a story with a usually good Superman turns evil. But I really wish it didn't keep him from making Superman good in the present. I think it would be much more effective if there was a stronger contrast between good Superman and evil Superman. Uh, let's see. Okay, so, spoiler for the MCU. Scarlet Witch, you know, Wanda Maximoff. That's really effective, in part because we see how happy and sweet and loving she can be. No more spoilers for the MCU for the time being. How did Darkseid... I th How did Darkseid forget what planet the Mother Boxes was on? It's the one battle he lost. I have a solution. I realize this means going back to the drawing board. I'm not saying that you could just edit around it. That battle took place on another planet. And after that, the people who took part in that battle decided to move the Mother Boxes, which at the time couldn't be tracked. You know, the, the tracking activates when Superman dies. You could still have it be that the people all step up to fight to protect this other planet. All that really requires is for someone to transport, the, you know, these people who start out on Earth so that, yeah, travels to, to that other planet. We know that at least one Green Lantern was involved, you know, who can, you know, they can travel through space. The Green Lantern, you know, have it be that the Green Lantern Corps arranged for some spacecraft, transported all the people to this other planet, which didn't have defenders. And if you ask, well, how did they know that Darkseid was going there? Well, Darkseid has been going around conquering planets all over the place. And presumably at some point, the Green Lantern Corps, who protect the entire universe, would take notice, track the movements of Darkseid, and voila. They, they deduced where he was going next because it was tactically advantageous for him. This would also help explain why no Green Lantern shows up during the events of this movie. They felt confident that Darkseid would never find the new location of the Mother Boxes. Maybe they don't think that anything will ever kill Superman. Maybe they don't know that Superman's death cry can awaken the Mother Boxes. So, I'm not the first person to point out that the... It doesn't really make sense that Steppenwolf can teleport directly to the Amazon mother box. Let's see. And the you know the Atlantis one he finds after using mind reading on Atlantean, but he has a lot of trouble finding the box of man. He keeps talking about people who have the scent of it. Went to the research facility where Silas Stone works, but he has to in individually interrogate the people who work there. And Yes, I realize this was a plot hole in the theatrical cut as well. But it seems like it must have been written by Snyder, not Joss Whedon. If not, why is it in Zack's cut? Once again, Joss Whedon did his best to fix Snyder's many mistakes. This was an area where trouble... What does that say? Yeah, they had trouble fitting it into the runtime of the filming schedule. That prevented him, I think. 
Doesn't seem to me like the scene added to this cut, where a parademon almost enters Silas and Victor's apartment. And... It doesn't actually make more sense, it makes less sense. I think the way to fix this thing of why Steppenwolf or the parademons find that mother box... Yeah, I can't find that mother box despite the whole scent thing. Drop the scent thing, make it that the more people from the race that is hiding the mother box think about the mother box, you know, the easier it is for Steppenwolf to find it. Like, he can do a psychic scan, he doesn't have general telepathy, but he can, like, scan the minds of an overall race of people for thoughts about a mother box specifically. And if a significant amount of them are thinking about the mother box, then he can pinpoint where it is because so many of them know where it is. The good guys don't know this, which is why they make this mistake. The Amazonians have a ton of people thinking about the mother box, worrying about the return of Darkseid, failing that one as lieutenants. I'm referring to all the people standing inside the temple waiting for the return of someone who will take it, but also their families who know that's what they're doing and are scared for their safety. Amazonians strike me as being honest with each other. The only lie I can think of were a few to protect Diana. I'm not sure anybody, anyone but Diana were, was lied to there and the lie started when she was a child many parents maybe most lie to their children in atlantis there are not that many guards but maybe king orm has been using the threat of someone coming to take the mother box to unite his people which is something that fascists do they use fear to control their people so he's always talking about it has been since the mother books awoke when superman died and there you have it the reason why it took so long to find the box of man is that almost no human being knows about the existence of the mother box, much less where it is, because it is a closely guarded secret. Only the people at the research facility know that it exists, and only Silas knows exactly where it is, and because it takes so long for Steppenwolf to get the opportunity to interrogate Silas, since at first he doesn't even know who or where to look at at all in the world of man, he only gets to interrogate Silas very late in the story, I mean, I guess he never, yeah, I don't think he does interrogate Silas in either cut. He finds the box because they use it to revive Superman. Now. He doesn't get a chance when Cyborg stops him, as we see in the movie. Or maybe he knows it has to do with Silas, and Cyborg got so angry it must be. Silas and or Cyborg knows, so he researches where do they work, where do they live. Parademons do not find it where they live, must, so it must be at the research facility, and then he finds it. Now, um, so this movie confirms that General Swanwick was played by Harry Lennox, was actually the Martian Manhunter, or John Jones. And, you know, Snyder said Swanwick was always Martian Manhunter since Man of Steel. You know, he, yeah, the, the, I, I feel like I read that Lennox didn't realize that the character was going to be Martian Manhunter until this cut but yeah you know Swanwick was always Martian Manhunter according to Snyder since Man of Steel he's been guiding Clark, Lois and mankind as a whole pushing them to do good as he wants mankind to take action and try to protecting Earth from first or again directly involved himself I can't think of very many things he did in Man of Steel or Batman or Superman that helped guide other characters in this movie he does pose as Martha Kent in order to encourage Lois Lane to go back to work but really, the that I've, that is essentially the only one. Like, there's several times where he actually encourages. He tries to do, like in Batman v Superman, he tells her to let go of the story about the bullet, and that turns out to be like I don't know. Is it supposed to be reverse psychology? So in the ending, Superman is sadistic, almost like you know, he he cuts off. 
he yeah he basically cut cuts off Steppenwolf's ear. You know the S Superman shouldn't be that sadistic. Really, before Zack Snyder, you know, uh, yeah, actually, right. Actually, he shouldn't be sadistic at all. Now, and yeah, in Man of Steel, you know, he was unwilling to, you know, he didn't want to be killing General Zod. He only did it when he thought there were no other options. And almost every time he kills in Batman or Superman is in the nightmare future. Doomsday was written to be impossible to stop other than killing him. But don't give me that any of that crap. Uh, maybe <laughs> what's that say? I really need more sleep. Um, right, the the things that might have happened, you know, Zack Snyder desperately wanted to make a movie where that yeah, he, he wants Superman to kill people in his movies. And this time he didn't even bother including stuff like that because he just wants Superman to kill people in his movies. And, and yeah, again I say just pick a character where that fits. There's plenty of them. And you know, Superman was working his way to murdering Steppenwolf. Wonder Woman chops his head off with her sword. You know, the one that she didn't even carry in the Wonder Woman 1984 because director Patty Jenkins felt that she should not intentionally use violence. Once again, my favorite move, you know, of, I don't know, one, it used to be one of my favorite Punisher Warzone used to be one of my favorite movies. Under the right circumstances, I do want the protagonist to, you know, to be depicted as as killing to, you know, yeah. What's that say? And, you know, if... If it's right for the character, they can even be sadistic about it. Yeah, actually, you know, Aquaman, Wonder Woman, and Superman, the three, the, yeah, the, the three that were born superhuman all take part in killing Steppenwolf. Zack Snyder and Patty Jenkins have both expressed support for each other. And certainly Jenkins for Snyder's vision. Clearly Snyder doesn't care about these characters being consistent across movies. That goes for Wonder Woman and Aquaman both. Snyder just wants these to take these icons of hope, justice, and empathy and do character assassination. If you badly want the movie to end with a character willfully killing Steppenwolf, have it be dark side. Have it be that Steppenwolf just barely makes it into the portal alive. He pathetically grovels in front of Dark Side, terrified of the consequences. Like literally, he's on the ground, on the ground in front of Dark Side. And have the two hero Yeah, have the two heroes assert. If you ever come to Earth again, we will stop you again. And then Dark Side goes, He'll never come to Earth again, and steps on his head the way he does in the Snyder Cut. I mean, you could even have that shock the two heroes watching, you know, have it be a major sign that Darkseid is much worse than Steppenwolf. You know, since Snyder really badly wants to make a movie where Darkseid is the main villain, where Superman is evil and kills, so showing him almost killing in this means that it's not that much of a stretch for him to kill. Alfred, for once, I'm operating strictly on faith, not reason. Yeah, because this Batman has been so reasonable, never. We live in a society 
That is some weapons grade cringe. I'm really glad it's only in the trailer. Well, I'll be in touch. Oh, and some have called me the Martian Manhunter. Why did you say that, man? No, seriously. Why would you like it's such a such an awkward like way to force in the Yeah. And according to IMDb trivia, this is the first film to have the Joker character in it, in which she does not kill, maim, inflict physical harm, blow up something, or do anything that could be considered f violent to anyone or anything. Then what's the point? Why have the character appear if you're not going to have them do something like that? I haven't read the comic, but as far as I understand, there is like a thematic reason for Superman's costume be to be black when he comes back from the dead and yeah you know that thematic point that yeah that apparently isn't in this movie I mean if I were a really big fan I would specifically think it was frustrating that it's there if it's so superficial I'm not telling anyone not to like the nightmare sequence at the end of the movie, but let's not pretend that this is anything other than Snyder trying to make hashtag restore the Snyderverse trend on Twitter. It's practically a demo reel. He's saying, if you hassle Warner Brothers enough that they rehire me for Justice League 2 and or 3, this is what you're going to get. I would have been far more impressed with more resolution than sequel baiting. Two movies in a row, sequel baiting. At least he didn't really do it in Man of Steel. In the theatrical cut, it's been a year since Superman died. And because of that, I have an easier time accepting that when... What does it say? Right, right, yeah. Uh, when when they revive Superman, since it's been so long, he could recover after the fight against Batman and Doomsday. And before you say wait, fighting Batman, yeah, you know he got he got badly wounded by the Krypton Kryptonite spear, you know. But in this version, it's only been a few weeks, so how is he back to full power? Like, if it's because a mother box was part of it, I would expect him to look at least a tiny bit different in order to show it, you know. Like how the the Zod... Let's see. All right, right, sorry. Zod, they didn't use a, a mother box to for that. That was the... That was something the Kryptonian ship could do. But yeah, but the, I mean, they're using the same part of the Kryptonian ship for resurrecting. They're just also using a mother box. Anyway. I've seen a number of people saying, oh, you know, they should have just, they should have just put this version of the movie in, in theaters. I don't, I'm not going to spend a really long time explaining why a four hour movie didn't make it direct to theaters without getting trimmed down at least. So let's just like, seriously, if you think there is a good answer, comment down below. Without trimming it down in a similar way to the theatrical cut. Maybe like, I think if the theatrical cut was half an hour longer, a lot of the, the you know, it, it would, it could have included a lot of, of the, the best stuff. Anyway. Let's say, okay, you know, we can cut this movie in half. We can have a movie that's two hours, maybe two and a half. And it would, but, but it needs to be satisfying for people. It needs to have both setup and payoff. Where would you cut this movie other than just trimming out all the fat? That I, I, seriously, if you have an answer to that, put it in the comments. But I, I can't think of I, I read someone who admitted that the you know essentially let's see I think he said that 
hypothetically you could cut after let's see was it right either right before or right after they revive superman or something like that but that is you know if you if you yeah if you cut it at that point then there's you uh, work. yeah it it either like for for the movie to have been significantly shorter and still satisfying it would have um ah i got to just power through this okay And yeah, I already mentioned, you know, the, the theatrical cut would be better if it was just a half an hour longer. Honestly, now having watched both versions of this movie, I'd rather have Joss be in charge of that half hour than, than Snyder. I I get why Cyborg needs a conflict. The movie wouldn't be the movie would be very different, possibly not as good if he just immediately joined the Justice League. But it doesn't have to be that he doesn't care about anyone. You know, it could just be that he's scared that if he becomes a hero, you know, ordinary people if they see him, they'll hate him because of, you know, the the his new appearance. That way, the conflict is still in part that he hates what he has become. It doesn't have to lead to him hating everyone in the world. And this way, he we can still have him seeing himself as he was before the car accident. In the you know when when he's trying to separate the mother boxes and then him accepting the way he looks now. So Barry Allen's conflict works fine, I think. Like he starts out insecure, ends up overcoming his insecurity. But, you know, he, he breaks this one rule, running so fast that he makes time move backwards. Before, he was afraid what it would do to, to the flow of time, but now that Earth is going to be destroyed if he doesn't do it, you know, he might as well take the shot. Like, the worst thing that could happen is that it's his own fault that the world is destroyed, and I guess he's content to live with that. So I I figure the reason that the Atlanteans don't help the Justice League is they're worried about being punished by King Orm, but what about Mira? She helps Aquaman in the solo movie, which once again had come out by the time they were making this cut of Justice League. Just have there be some reason honestly how about after the attack on her she tells arthur i won't be able to help you for the next i don't know two days or something you know steppenwolf injured me so badly i need to recover something like that i'm at least almost certain that there isn't something like that in this movie anyway so, considering that the mother box is trying to trick you into evil, why couldn't that be why Superman is suddenly attacking everyone? And then Lois Lane makes him remember who he is. Like, there's no good reason for Superman to just immediately try to kill people when he doesn't remember, like, the... Yeah. Okay, so <sighs> back. Okay. 
Okay, so. One of the things that bothers me about when Zack Snyder is clearly gleeful at the idea of depicting Superman killing, but he pretends that he actually believes there's an ethical issue there. And I've seen some of his defenders play along with that. It reminds me distinctly of when conservatives find ways to threaten political violence without coming right out and saying it and then pretending like that isn't what they're doing. So what we mentioned, a political enemy and, and or issue, and then sent Second Amendment, that doesn't have to mean that we use the Second Amendment against these political enemies. Just be honest about it. And no, obviously I'm not saying that it's that they're equivalent. One is fictional, one is not. Just saying it's the same tactic. Anyway, Superman say? had to kill Zod. There was no other way. And the and the amount of collateral damage means these you know that's because he's not yet good at being Superman. Well, why wouldn't we want you know why why would we want to see Superman suck at what he does and completely fail and get thousands or millions killed? Don't worry about him killing a Batman's nightmare. That's not the current Superman. Of course we Of course we aren't desperately hoping that Zack Snyder gets to make a movie where Superman is just pure evil and murdering people intentionally. Of course Superman recently resurrected starts killing people. What? Are you telling me that when you wake up and you're confused you don't immediately start trying to kill people? So I rewatched the theatrical cut. Let's see. Still not saying it's a good movie, but a lot of it is better than this. Let's see. Yeah, Lois Lois Lane did go to work. She was just she was just only writing puff pieces because it was too hard. But in this one, you know, I'm not saying that you are weak if grief really destroys you but I just don't think I think if you're going to depict grief as strongly as this movie does then the movie shouldn't lead to the person grieving getting that the person they're grieving the loss of back and in the theatrical cut Victor has powers but it's a confusing situation to be in very alienating which makes it easier to have empathy for him than in this version where he just doesn't care about other people and there it makes better sense that he automatically shoots Superman than it does here and in the original in the theatrical cut Steppenwolf does know what planet the, bo the mother boxes are on. He's just waiting for everyone who fought him the first time to either have died or no longer be allied with, and for people to lose hope, which happens when Superman dies. In this version, in, yeah, in the in Snyder Cut, somehow Darkseid and his people forgot what planet the mother boxes was on, even though it was the most important thing to them. And the only battle that Darkseid lost. In the theatrical cut, Steppenwolf doesn't contact Desad and Darkseid. And since he doesn't get anything, he doesn't accomplish anything by contacting them in this movie, it's just a way for Darkseid to show up in the movie a couple of times or be mentioned a couple of times. We don't actually get anything interesting out of it. So, the climax ends very quickly in the theatrical, but it's not like the movie's lacks on action scenes. Given that Steppenwolf is a special effect, there's no good reason why Darkseid couldn't have been in this movie instead of Steppenwolf. I don't think anybody wants to see Steppenwolf more than they want to see Darkseid. Both are dark gray in appearance, bleak in tone. 
I mean, you could have just said that he underestimated her for Earth for a second time, and the movie ends with him saying there won't be a third mistake, and that's why he doesn't bring enough parademons. And you would need him to not constantly be using the Omega Beams, the lasers he shoots out of his eyes. But again, if you say that he's underestimating the Justice League, I mean, according to this movie, if Steppenwolf was more effective with the axe, he could easily have taken out the Justice League because it, it cleaves right through Judd. What does that say? So, cleaves right through Cyborg's body, the Lunar person were clearly shown to be immune to the axe as Superman, and he's only on the team at the very end of the movie. Honestly, the only reason I can think of is that Zack Snyder wants this movie to end with the big villain dying. It's not that exciting to see the big bad sitting on a throne instead of taking part in the movie, and by 2017, when the theatrical cut came out, that should have been clear from the MCU. In fact, they could have beaten the MCU to getting the god on screen if Darkseid was in 2017 movie, given that Thanos first played a big role in a 2018 movie. I remember people criticizing the decision to include Steppenwolf instead of Darkseid in 2017. Based on this, evidently that was Snyder's idea, not just Whedon's. Remember that this movie is the Snyder Cut, it's Snyder's vision. And he put, did put Darkseid in the movie, just made him sit back and wait for someone else that he, like, apparently does not trust to get the job done, to get the job done. I have to, I have to wonder, is, is, is Zack Snyder even capable of having two male characters in one of his movies discuss something without one of them being strong, the other one weak, and thereby wrong? And probably wrong for the wrong reason to be wrong, too. Or that both of them are strong and therefore irrationally angry at each other, mistrusting each other, never agreeing, not communicating like grown-ups. He defines strength and masculinity like this. Why are so many men perfectly happy for him to show men like this, but when female feminists describe men like this, they get furious? Is it really just because he thinks it's a positive thing, and he's a man, whereas, you know, female feminists and I as a feminist point out that this is harmful behavior. And let's see, that brings us to the... Huh, I thought I wrote the entire up here. Here we go. Okay. So... Thank you for bearing with me for all this time. I have been talking for almost as long as the movie went on. If you like this video, please comment, thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one or two or more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on the movie, and one talking about the most recent episode of the current Disney Plus MCU show. These days, that is Hawkeye. And recently, the review and thoughts tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog, as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching, as I enjoyed watching... No, honestly, I did. Watching and recording, and I will catch you next time.